Hello friends, welcome to Challenger Tabletop. I'm Christopher and this is another Paint and Chat live stream where we're going to talk about 40k while I work on my collection. Let me just make sure everything's working here. Yeah, I think we're good. I got my cup of coffee ready to do some painting and some, uh, what, modifying some, some tanks. Uh, basically what I'm going to be working on today is converting some of my Gene Stealer Cult's Brood Brothers. Those are Imperial Guard troops who fight uh, on behalf of the, Imper of the uh, Gene Stealer Cults into good old regular Astra Militarum Imperial Guard or maybe Planetary Defense Force. So uh, I have a few Lehman Rust tanks and a bunch of infantry where I'm more or less just going to be repainting the skin on the characters from bright pink, kind of an alien color I was using, over to more natural human colors. And I got my nice big cup of coffee, or actually I have a full French press, and I'm working overnight tonight, so I get to drink as much coffee as I want, one of the perks of that. And for a discussion topic today, I thought we could talk about army narrative. Hey, we already got a chatter. Welcome, the clear sound of jewels. Welcome back. Sounds like you're working on some chaos conversions. Cool. That sounds exciting. Uh, chaos is a perfect uh, faction to convert and modify your own models for. I remember I worked with someone who was thinking about starting chaos and he wanted to kitbash uh, chaos and um, what are they? Uh, space wolves. Hey, RS Blunden's back. Good evening. Welcome to the chat. Great to have you guys here. Well, shall I show you some of what I'm going to be working on tonight? And I thought I'd kind of go through some of my various factions I play and how I came up with the narrative for the, for the army. Including eventually my um, Imperial Guard, who I'm still kind of working on the narrative for them now. So here we go. Here's the one of the Lehman Russes I'll be working on. And I painted these to look like they were Mechanicus red and then they'd been left to kind of age and rust in a warehouse somewhere for a hundred years before they were eventually dug out by the Gene Stealer cult and, and made functional. But if I zoom in on the pilot here, you can see he's got this kind of bright pink skin which is uh, kind of what I use for my Gene Stealer cults. And I was actually thinking maybe I'd take this guy out and just close the hatch. I don't know, I haven't fully decided. Yeah, it's glued on there. Maybe I'll leave him as is. He'd be a good Imperial Guard tank pilot, but I don't know, do you guys think he'd be a good tank commander? Can you put up an imager link? Sure, go ahead, clear sound. I'm not gonna look at it now, but I'll check it out later. Alright, I want to kind of dive in on this. Uh, so here's a, another Lehman Russ. Well, Alright, I'll take a look. You convinced me. So, checking out your link. Ooh, cool. Alright, these look like obliterators that you're turning into like uh, Chaos Spawn or something. Very fun. Beautiful work. I love the green stuff. You've got some green stuff, kind of uh, talons and uh, horns that kind of look like maybe tentacles. Very fun. I love those old metal obliterators. Sure, they're kind of small by, compared to today's obliterators, but they're still cool. Well, uh, here is, uh, yep, in the process of turning it into a spawn. Very cool. Well, here is the weirdest Lehman Rust tank I own. And um, there's something a bit off about this woman. Uh, like, uh, let me just sh uh, compare. Well, actually, that one has similar turret. Here's a Lehman Russ. I think this was a kit that could be turned into a demolisher of various types. It has a wider front of the turret, whereas this one is quite small. And it has kind of like a chunky las cannon. Uh, it's, it's actually movable, though it's kind of uh, fused in place a little bit by paint. There we go. It has like a, a sort of a bigger, thicker las cannon on it. And uh, I kind of feel like this was some kind of cheapo Lehman Russ that was 
probably had no options. And you can see it's got a narrower front there. What year is the second one from? Honestly, I have no idea. And uh, this was my first Lehman Russ and it was a, a free model someone gave me because it was missing parts. You see, I had to make the uh, tank treads from scratch. So those are just uh, plastic card or maybe even cardboard tank turrets. I'm not sure what I made them out of. And I had to improvise a little uh, driver's uh, sight slot here. And there's no housing around the weapon. Is it magnetized? Doesn't feel like it. Oh, no, it is. There you go. Magnetized las cannon, but no housing around it. Like if you look at these others, you can see there is a housing on around that las cannon. And that's what the driver's sight is supposed to look like. But yeah, kind of a hodgepodge here, and I think that's got to be part of the uh, lore of my Imperial Guard army is that they're sort of making do with whatever they can scrap together as they're going to be located in the Icarus system, which is sort of far from the center of the Imperium, uh, out on the edge of the uh, Segmentum Pacificus, between the Segmentum Pacificus and the Halo Stars. But uh, I do have a cockpit cover for this one, which I got off of a Rhino. So I was gonna probably glue that together. Maybe we'll start with that. So yeah, uh, basically continuing with what I was doing yesterday, which is just trying to clear the sort of low hanging fruit from my uh, painting desk here, uh, finishing stuff that's already underway or seems like it wouldn't be too difficult to do. And uh, that includes converting my brood brothers to imperial guard as mostly i'm just having to paint their faces and hands and then they're done let's see if i can glue that together flat on the table there hopefully that'll stick all right and i may have to trim it a bit not sure looks like i've already kind of hacked these pieces up a bit but once they're painted they won't look as ramshackle uh, well, um, Blunden, are you, what are you up to this evening? Are you doing some hobbying? And I'm also curious, uh, what factions do you guys play? It sounds like Clear Sound of Jewels plays Chaos. And have you guys ever thought about your army lore? Oh, cool. Blunden's been watching the Las Vegas Open all day. Uh, probably the most famous Warhammer tournament in the world these days, or is the grand tournament in uh, England a thing? I hear about the Las Vegas Open all year round, and I guess it's finally going. I saw some uh, Instagram posts by uh, Stephen from Vanguard Tactics. Uh, looks like he's there in Las Vegas doing his usual uh, workout routine. Definitely inspired by his uh, fit for 40k uh, effort to get everyone in the hobby working out and looking their best and staying fit. Well, uh, can I just go ahead and drop this right on the top here? Oh, and a uh, quick update on something I was working on last night. Uh, this is my Gene Sealer Colts Patriarch, and I last night I was working on these little helmets around the bottom of his base, and I painted his tongue and did a little touch up on his claws. Well, uh, turns out he was actually on too large of a base. I measured it and it was 65 millimeter instead of 50. So I found a 50 millimeter base that would work for him, and I basically cut up that other base with uh, clippers so it would fit on here. Oh, Clear Sound of Jewels. The Chaos Stuff is a tribute army for a friend who passed. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't come up with any narrative for it yet. As far as playing, I'm making a Chaos Knights army because I love big robots. Awesome. I've actually played a couple games against my friend uh, Mortimer's Chaos Knights. And um, they are very strong. <laughs> I lost the game, but it was close. Uh, I was playing my 10th Company Dark Angels, so... I basically started in the midfield on all of the objectives and he just had to charge at me and push me off of them. And of his three knights and two warhounds, I think they're called, or war dogs, I killed only the two war dogs. And they're kind of the chaos equivalent of 
Armagers, Armagers, which I'm sure you know. And um, yeah, it was a very tough game. I came close to killing one of the knights, but they are super tough. Well, uh, this would be a fun and quick thing to finish. Maybe I'll do this right after uh, I figure out what I'm going to do with this Lehman Russ um, hatch here. See if I can get this to stay. I wonder am I blocking some light here? Nah. <laughs> Sorry for fiddling with the cameras there. Okay, uh, does it want to fit or not? It looks like it will if I just modify it a little bit. I think the issue is just a couple of these pegs are a little too close. Mainly just this one right here. Let's come in there with the X-Acto knife. Get rid of that little bit and I think it is going to fit. Still not quite. Oh, I guess it, now it's hitting the other side. Unfortunately, I'm out of the actual correct style of Lehman Russ uh, hatch. So I'm just making do with what I have available. Oh, and the glue did not hold. Let's maybe try that again. Let's see if I can get it to fit a little more flush this time. Well, are you guys having a good day? Sorry to hear about your friend who passed away. And I'm curious what you are going to do with the tribute army. How did that idea come about? I assume your friend was into 40K? I lost uh, my childhood best friend about maybe four or five years ago now to diabetes. I went to his uh, celebration of life down in uh, Florida, which is my one time going down there. It was a sad time, but I'm glad I went. Got to spend some time with his family who I hadn't seen in a while. And they live over in England. And uh, there are some friends who I actually used to play 40k with. Uh, way back in the day, we all kind of got into the game around the same time. Uh, ben collected Eldar, uh, he's the one who passed away. His brother Max uh, had uh, Chaos, I want to say. And uh, I was collecting Space Marines. All right, that's looking a little better. Let's see if we can get this to fit in here. Doesn't quite want to sit flat. Hard to tell exactly what the issue is. Looks like it's kind of raised up over here. Just the paint is super thick. Um, the Clear Sound of Jewels says, Yeah, he and I were both planning fantasy armies when he passed. I inherited all of his chaos stuff. So I've been sitting on the hobby for a while. Well, that's going to that's gonna be really a uh, neat way to remember your friend. You're always going to think of him whenever you play that army. Uh, so I'm curious. Uh, it looks like you're working on a 40k model, but you say... Uh, he, he collected fantasy. Did he also have some Chaos 40k? Or what's the story there? But a uh, very cool way to remember your friend. To make a tribute army. Reminds me of... Um, was it... Uh, I want to say... In Control... Uh, I think he was most known for video games and StarCraft and stuff, but I, I think I heard that he played Warhammer and a bunch of his friends purchased his armies at kind of an estate sale to raise money for his family and his funeral. And so some people still like uh, had his collection of 40k or something as a way to remember him. Some of his friends in the hobby. But I, I could be getting that wrong. I'm just trying to remember what I heard about that. Hmm. Oh, of course I dropped the bit. I think it's my first time dropping a bit on cam. 
Fortunately, I didn't have to uh, hunt for it too long. I'm sure everybody knows the pain of dropping a bit and not being able to find it. The Clear Sound of Jewels says, So we were both getting into fantasy together as a way of me learning tabletop games. He had been playing since childhood, so we both uh, decided to learn something new. Okay, so he must have already had uh, uh, Chaos Army for 40k, it sounds like. Judging from the, the miniature you're working on. And uh, I really like the job you're doing on it. Looks like you're really giving it some good attention. Uh, it'd be really cool to figure out a way to kind of... Um, commemorate your friend in the lore of your game in uh, in the lore of your army uh, i have a lot of fun naming my uh characters after various people sometimes uh characters from tv shows uh, i guess i'll get into that with each army okay so you say yeah he had a chaos and knit army very cool those would be fun to play um you should totally name uh, uh the general of the army uh, the chaos army after him so I've been taking his old nid bits and sticking them onto the Chaos Army. Maybe do something Gene Steeler <laughs> Chaos Cult. Interesting. Very cool. Uh, well, the narrative for my armies uh, mostly has kind of uh, come about in a sort of gradual and... Hmm, what's the word? Kind of organic way. Uh, as I've been playing a narrative campaign of 40k uh, for pretty much about, I don't know, six years probably at least. And when I started that, I was really just playing Dark Angels. And the sort of beginning of the narrative campaign was that I created a campaign map. And it was based around one star system in the Imperium which I named the Icarus system. And I took my inspiration from the various weapons that are named Icarus this or Icarus that in 40K. And of course the um, myth of Icarus is that he was the assistant of Daedalus, an inventor. And the two of them were imprisoned on the isle, island of uh, what, Crete or Knossos? Uh, I forget exactly, but they're imprisoned on the same island where the king uh, had the Minotaur in the in the labyrinth. And basically, they were from Athens, which is sort of a free democratic city, but they were held captive by the king as his like royal inventors basically and Daedalus I, I believe is the one who actually designed the labyrinth of the Minotaur uh, as a way to keep the Minotaur busy clear sound of jewels says I'd like to find a group to play with and do narrative stuff I've been collecting on and off for six years still haven't played oh my gosh <laughs> well you absolutely must it would be really fun to play a uh, game together on Tabletop Simulator, if you have that. I don't have a lot of free time as I'm working two jobs, but uh, it would be really cool to play a game with you. Uh, that's like one way that you can kind of uh, get outside your own little hobby area and find place play with some people long distance. And uh, I guess uh, let us know where you're located, because that could also help people find you and reach out to play a game together. Uh, I'm here in Portland, Oregon, and part of the dream for my uh, Twitch and YouTube channel is that I would eventually be able to get people to come travel here to play against me. So if you're in the neighborhood of Portland, Oregon, you're definitely welcome to come play a game over here at my home studio. Uh, I'd be interested. Is it possible to play over a couple days? Absolutely. Tabletop Simulator is perfect for uh, putting a game on pause and coming back to it later. So very good for that. All right. This is still not fitting. Let me think about what I could do to 
get these to fit flush on the top here. I'm trying to go for just a closed tank turret using these, this hatch. And I think what's holding me back is probably the, the little pegs in the front. And it's, it's barely holding me back. You, uh, let's see if I can zoom in there. You can see there's just a little bit of a gap. And if I get the gap closed at the front, there's a gap in the back. Hmm. What is the answer? I think it's to maybe just trim off these two bits in front. Oh, hey, welcome, Renegade79. Uh, Did I miss the narrative? Nope, uh, I'm just sort of getting into it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how I came up with the narrative for my four factions I already uh, play and talk a little bit about the narrative I'm working on for this uh, Imperial Guard army that you see me working on tonight. And uh, I'll talk a little bit generally about coming up with a narrative for your own army or factions. Some kind of uh, ideas for inspiration. Uh, good to have you in the chat, Renegade. Uh, what factions do you play? I'm curious to hear. If you uh, already play 40k, that is. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you think you told told me yours already. Sorry, I my, uh, might need a refresher there. Had a lot of people chat in the last couple days, so uh, it's not fresh in my mind. Apparently we got the Las Vegas going, Las Vegas Open going. Oh, the Lord Commissar and the Psyker Girl. Huh, no, I don't know if I remember that. Uh, Love in the Grim Dark Millennium. Oh, this sounds great. No, I don't think I have heard this. It sounds like a very fun and creative uh, backstory. Uh, if she ever gets Perils of the Warp. Oh no. Okay. Trying to get this uh, hatch on this Lehman Rust to fit flush. And I think I finally got it where it's gonna work. It's looking good in the front. And back's okay, all right. Let's glue this down and call it good. A tr it, he, it, if Oh, if she ever gets Perils of the War, he has to pull the trigger. It's a tragic love story and it plays out on the tabletop. Well, that's really fun. Well, uh, the beginning for my army narrative or army lore uh, for my various factions came about with the campaign setting that I uh, started for me and my friends to play narrative games in. So this is the Icarus system. Oh, and I guess I got sidetracked talking about the uh, myth of Icarus. But I guess I'll just wrap it up that uh, Daedalus invents the wax wings to escape from the island. Uh, and he and Icarus fly to mainland Europe using the wings, but uh, Icarus gets too close to the sun and his wings melt and he falls into the ocean and dies. Uh, and uh, many years ago, I wrote a play for kids based on this uh, story combined with the uh, Theseus and the Minotaur. And uh, so I had kind of like Daedalus and Icarus kind of floating around in my head and I've seen so many weapons labeled Icarus, you know, rocket pod, Icarus, las cannon, etc. So I thought, okay, I'll make the Icarus system where maybe the STCs for these various weapons were rediscovered, or maybe it's where they're manufactured or something. So uh, I made a map of the Icarus system and we've been playing uh, campaign games narrative games in the Icarus system for, I don't know, five or six years probably at this point. And when we started, I only played Dark Angels and I really didn't do anything too complex for my army narrative. It was basically uh, coming up with the name of the ship that they uh, entered the system aboard and coming up with some names for my uh, warlord, captain, stuff like that. 
Uh, but um, as far as the names for my Dark Angels, I was inspired by basically the names that Dark Angels already have that are canon in the lore. So you have names like Azrael, Ezekiel, um, Samael, and those are all basically angel names from the Bible or um, what they call Apocrypha, which are like religious writings that were not included in the Bible. So I basically figured it must be that every dark angel has an, a fallen angel name. Oh, okay. It's just world building so far, says Renegade. Uh, that's all we've... <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. So, uh, I, for naming the rest of my Dark Angels, I would just go on the internet, find some lists of Fallen Angel names, and basically pick ones I like. It's enough for a general campaign. Yeah. You really, honestly, it doesn't take a whole lot to just add a little bit of depth and personality to your army. So, in my case, I named the ship that the Dark Angels are embarked on. The Emperor's Archangel and I came up with names for my various characters and that was pretty much it and then as I was playing the campaign uh, I eventually started to transition to uh, like an all Primaris force oh Renegade says I'm looking for bits to make a regimental band for their wedding which will get attacked oh no that's really funny um, wouldn't it be great to just have a squad of Imperial Guard that are carrying LAS cannons, but they all also have an instrument? That would just be uh, hilarious. <laughs> oh, I like how you have some humor in your uh, army lore. That's a, a, a really uh, clever thing. All right, well, I'm calling it good on this tank turret. We got it glued down pretty flat there. So we've now changed it. I removed the Gene Stealer cult character from it. So we've changed it from being uh, cult brood brothers to just a, a standard Lehman Rust now. Renegade has a piper, a horn blower, a drummer, and something else. Hmm. Well, this sounds like a command squad. You could have a banner bearer, uh, but uh, totally need bagpipes. <laughs> a bagpiper would be uh, hilarious. Hmm. You say you have a piper. Maybe that could be the bagpipes. Oh, it's a command squad proxy. Perfect. Yeah. The bullet magnet squad. That's great. All right. Well, let's take a break from the Lehman Ruffs as I'm going to slap some gray paint on the little red sand I glued around this uh, edge of the space. Uh, I didn't feel like totally clipping off all these Space Marine helmets and gluing them to a new base. So I just cut down the existing base, glued it straight down to this 50 millimeter and then scattered sand uh, glued some sand around the edge to help it blend in uh, so now we're just going to be painting gray paint straight over the sand with no primer and as long as we slop it on thick enough it'll work okay looking for my administratum gray here probably want to zoom out a little bit so i don't have to be super careful with the positioning of the miniature So I think we're pretty much caught up on the lore of my Dark Angels. Oh, no, then uh, then then I switched to Primaris. So the Dark Angels are one of the chapters that has kind of a spotty relationship with their own Primaris reinforcements. The Dark Angels have the sort of chapter secret that... Uh, a bunch of their brothers turned to chaos during the Horus Heresy. And there was a big question when all the chapters started getting Primaris reinforcements. How are the Dark Angels going to control their secret with all these new reinforcements showing up? Uh, Renegade says, and there's no fallen Primaris so far. Interesting. Yeah, so there might be some real judgment from the Primaris if they're so uncorruptible and they find out about the Dark Angels hiding this secret from the rest of the Imperium, 
you know, where is their true loyalty going to lie? Are they going to confess the truth to Gilliman because he's like their their real Primarch who they've been fighting with throughout the entire Indomitus Crusade? Or can they be trusted to join the inner circle and keep the secret of the Fallen and help in the hunt for the Fallen? So that's kind of the... Uh, big question with the Dark Angels and the Primaris and the Fallen. Renegade says, I did think it could brew into Civil War, Primaris versus Firstborn Marines. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it could, except that I think uh, Games Workshop is kind of in a hurry to phase out the Firstborn, so they're, uh, I don't think they're going to feature specifically in, in the lore as Firstborn versus anything. Uh, I, I have a feeling they're more or less going to go with the Firstborn gradually crossing the Rubicon until there's none left route. And uh, Dark Angels are still waiting, I think, for any of their characters to come out as a Primaris version. Uh, so I don't know if Dark Angels have yet to cross the Rubicon or if we just uh, don't have any miniatures to reflect it yet. Um, I know a lot of Dark Angels players are really calling for a Primaris Azrael uh, to the point that it's probably the most common kit bash for Dark Angels players is to just make our own Primaris Azrael. And they just use the, the straight up rules for Azrael, but uh, have him as Primaris size. Uh, Renegade, they were really brewing the bad feelings about Primaris. Kalgar finally meeting his Primarch. Uh, well, I, I do think that there is a possibility of a civil war in the Imperium. Oh, and being passed over by the Primaris. Well, I think that we may see a, a civil war in the Imperium, and I do think it could be a war against the Dark Angels, perhaps. Um, and my kind of theory slash prediction is that a storyline like that might really fit with the return of both um, Lionel Johnson, the Dark Angels Primarch, who's supposedly awake in the bowels of the rock, the Dark Angels uh, Fortress asteroid, um, fighting against Lehman Russ, uh, who, who returns from the warp to hunt him down or something like that. And you could have the Dark Angels all declared uh, excommunicat traitoris or whatever by the Inquisition. And you could actually have a whole storyline where the Inquisition are trying to wipe out the Dark Angels. And you have the Minotaur chap Minotaur's chapter and the Red Hunters and the Exorcists all sent to hunt down the Dark Angels. I think that could be really interesting. Uh, Lionel Johnson is hiding in the rock out of sheer embarrassment of the fallen, says Renegade. No comment. <laughs> As a Dark Angels player, I'll, I'll just uh, let you believe what you want about the fallen and Lionel Johnson. But there are some players who firmly believe or maybe jokingly believe that uh, Lionel Johnson is the real traitor and... Um, uh, what's his name? Luther, who supposedly betrayed him on Caliban, was actually staying loyal. But uh, I'm not sure that the lore supports that necessarily. All right. Well, we're starting to get around this base. Basically just trying to clear as much easy to finish stuff off of my hobby desk as I can tonight. So we'll be switching between a few things. Oh, clear sound is back. I haven't got enough knowledge to do anything historical. Uh, well, um, I basically had just uh, sort of heard that the Dark Angels were really unsure about the Primaris. And this was around the time that the book was coming out, The War of Secrets, about the Dark Angels and the Primaris and their sort of awkward meeting and everything. Um... Renegade, so he locked himself away out of shame. That's, that's possible, I guess. Uh, and uh, the clear sound of jewels are rather within the universe. Then there's room for new lore. 
so with my Primaris, I wanted to, or I started by getting the um, Phobos Marines box, the uh, sort of Vanguard, start collecting Vanguard Marines box. So it had like uh, infiltrators and uh, Invictor Warsuit and stuff like that. And I had the desire to paint my infiltrators black for like stealth night operations. But this is kind of like a uncouth or inappropriate thing for Dark Angels to do because the fallen who they're hunting are all have their armor painted black. And the Ravenwing chapter has their armor painted black. Or, I mean, the, the Ravenwing company, second company. Uh, Renegade. Actually, it's because he lost to Luther doing, during a psychic attack and he's been recovering. Be interesting if he's not really himself. <laughs> uh, Dark Angels players are really like been calling for the return of Lionel Johnson for, I want to say, at least 10 years since at least since they've been hinting about it in the lore which is i think back in seventh edition codex uh renegade the dark angel colors of the crusade era were black and red exactly so basically i figured that if a bunch of primaris reinforcements showed up all wearing black armor the firstborn dark angels in the icarus system aboard the emperor's archangel cruiser would probably not look on them too favorably, wouldn't necessarily trust them, and might actually send them on like suicide missions hoping they'd just kill themselves off. So that was kind of the, the route we went, or I went. Uh, Renegade, the Caliban green is the change. Well, the Ravenwing wear black. Right. Well, I actually do have uh, one green shoulder pad on my infiltrators, and my idea is like okay they do have the green shoulder pad and the dark angels insignia but they just have the rest of their armor painted black for stealth operations as they're generally uh infiltrating onto the battlefield during the night in order to get into position for the start of a battle and so we actually played some games when I was first switching to Primaris, actually the first games I played with Primaris, I think, was uh, kind of a storyline that uh, I came up with where the rest of the Dark Angels were sending them on a suicide mission to basically let them get killed or see if they're actually strong enough to survive. And so I fought a three game series against Tyranids. Uh, or maybe, maybe was it I think it was, yeah, just a three game series. We're gonna play three games and see who won the most and that kind of thing. And the sort of setup for the battle was that the Primaris forces had been sent down to Transcendence Moon to try and reach uh, this Tyranid hive ship location where a hive ship came down, or a scout ship, I guess, came down like a hundred years ago and the Dark Angels were just returning to the sector after a, a sort of abandoning it for a hundred years. And they were sending the Primaris down to try to locate this, the Tyranid ship and like report on its current sta uh, status. But uh, the closer they get to the ship, the closer they get to the hive mind, they start to be detected by the Tyranid uh, creatures living in the wilderness. And before long, the hive mind starts to try to basically encircle and destroy them and then hunt them down as they retreat through the jungle trying to make it to extraction. All right, finished on the base. We'll give that a little spin around so you can, all right, let's zoom in a little more. There you go. So you can see the uh, all the dead Space Marine helmets and skulls on the base of my Patriarch. Had a lot of fun trying to make his base more deluxe and at the same time kind of uh, blend in the his actual base with the rest of the 50 millimeter. And got a few little uh, Necromunda heads I cut off when I turned uh, Necromunda models into uh, Gene Steeler Cult Neophyte hybrids. So yeah, there's that. Here's the finished model on the 50 millimeter base. Finally got him on the right size base. 
Renegade, so it was trial by fire. Yep, exactly. Forged in battle. And uh, the fun thing is that the Primaris actually won two out of the three games. So they proved themselves to their brothers and they survived to go on to become a important part of their chapter. Uh, well, this one, I uh, have the hatch just sitting on here. I had it magnetized at one point. Then I actually realized I was out of magnets and I decided to harvest them from this tank. So I just need to clean up the area where I've clipped those off. The Dark Angels will always be vigilant. <laughs> uh, and I guess eventually they were accepted into the inner circle even. I haven't read uh, that book. Was it War of Secrets? But um, I gather that eventually they decided that the Primaris could be trusted. In any case, uh, I guess that's about as much lore as I have for my Primaris Space Marines and my Dark Angels. I did uh, name the uh, sort of Primaris Phobos Captain. And um, for him, I was kind of wanting him to be like the mini-me on the battlefield. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Oh, I gotta go make dinner. Uh, see you later, uh, Clear Sound of Jewels, no problem. Definitely interested in playing some tabletop simulator though. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, let's see. I'm sure there's some way we can connect. Uh, message me on my Instagram if you have that. My Instagram is Challenger Tabletop, just like this channel. And Renegade, wow, what are you doing? <laughs> what am I doing right now? I'm just uh, cleaning this up a bit. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, m send me a message on there. We'll try to get a... Um, tabletop simulator going game going maybe we could even stream it on the channel although if you're just learning the game maybe uh you'd rather not do that live in front of a bunch of people not that we usually have a ton of viewers but get a few customize the tank tracks too yeah this tank was actually missing its tracks when uh, my friend gave it to me for free uh it was also missing this uh front little what coppola or whatever uh, around the weapon here so it was really a rescue project for sure and um clear sound says uh my insta's all pictures of my weed plants so don't be too weirded out oh no worries uh let's see looks like i should angle my camera a little bit more that way uh yep so this is a rescue tank um definitely sort of a bit of a scratch built rescue and let's see where's that hatch now i'm just gonna glue this hatch down I don't think it still has any uh, magnets, but I do want to clean up a little bit where I did have the magnets here. There's just some like uh, extra little gunk glue or something around the uh, edge of the hatch. There we go. All right, I think that's looking a little better. Let's just give that a couple dabs of super glue and call it good. Then I will uh, paint the little uh, areas where you can see bare plastic as well. All right, I think that should glue. Put another little dab along the edge. Uh, all my tanks were actually uh, uh, rescues of one sort or another. Uh, most of them come from eBay. Oh, uh, this one also has a, a homemade turret. Uh, I made this out of, uh, what is it, um, plastic card? Oh, it's upside down. So it has a uh, few options. I have um, auto cannon option and the battle cannon option, and that may be it. Uh, Renegade, I'm really happy with my Commissar lore story. Yeah, I love it, Renegade. <laughs> it gets people right in the feels. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I like how it's also got a bit of humor to it, too. All right. Um, and I do have some little magnets on here. Those are actually so I can attach, um, you know, pintle-mounted weapons like that. And the other one over on the side is for a, what do you call it? Uh, targeter or whatever. 
There you go. The thing that gives the free reroll to hit. I pretty much never have the points for one, but uh, if I ever can afford extra five points or something. Uh, Renegade says, his warlord trait is draconian disciplinarian. So he does D3 extra executions and her power is psychic augment plus one to hit. Oh, cool. I like how every time you uh, cast a warp power, everyone's going to be like right on the edge of their seat. <laughs> there actually is an ability, isn't there, where if you have a Kamazar next to someone who fails a, uh, a psychic test or gets perils of the warp, he can execute her so that no nobody takes uh, mortal wounds around her. That's That's really funny. Uh, the it's for your own good rule. Oh, great. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, uh, we've actually got two, th three things finished now. We got this tank, uh, got the uh, gene stealer removed and the hatch battened down. And this tank, we've done the same thing. Got the hatch down and the gene stealer out of there. Uh, maybe we should start painting some Imperial Guardsmen. We've got this guy here who's, I guess, like a tank commander. I guess that'll be easy way to tell my tank commander, so I'll actually have a dude sticking out of the hatch as opposed to nobody. And I do have this other one here on the demolisher <laughs> with the uh, broken wrist. And uh, I guess it'd be a lot easier to paint these guys if I uh, remove the uh, magnetized weapons. Sometimes it's actually easier to do it with the clippers so that I don't accidentally uh, rip off the magnet. All right, that makes them a lot easier to paint. And I also have a whole bunch of other Imperial Guardsmen to paint too. And I guess the tanks where we just uh, put the hatches down also need some red paint and some ink wash to fix them up. Uh, here's an interesting character. This is my uh, Clamavus for my uh, G Sealer cult. I guess he's out of focus. There we go. So he's made from an Imperial Guard Commissar, and my idea was he was a Commissar who got infected with the Gene Stealer uh, virus, and he ended up becoming a Clamavus, where he's basically like got a radio signal coming direct from the hive mind and he broadcasts it out of his loudspeakers to sort of uh, keep the cult hypnotized. I gave him a little Gene Stealer cult uh, icon on his belt where he previously had an Imperial uh, Aquila. But I'm thinking now I want to change this guy back to be a Commissar. So uh, I don't know if I'm going to work on that tonight. It seems like kind of a major uh, overhaul and I don't want to be digging through my bits bin on Kim because, uh, but I think that's what it's going to take. So we'll just set him aside. Probably want to find a little Imperial something to go over there, or else I'll just make a green stuff belt buckle for him. Uh, Renegade, so making it a love story is epic. Master of Master of Ordnance has a comms pack. Oh, good idea. But I, I do have a place in my army for a regular commissar. I have a Lord commissar already, but uh, he needs a, an assistant, right? I think I'll take the backpack off and he'll just have regular back. This is actually an old rogue trader commissar. And I'm probably uh, should go to prison for uh, cutting for like uh, cutting a metal uh, rogue trader miniature. All right, well let's take a quick look at some of the other miniatures I have sitting here to paint. Uh, sort of three categories here. Uh, Renegade, since I have a few of the plastic Commissar model, the twist is he's clones <laughs> and the Inquisition is on his case. Oh, that's funny. All right, so here's like uh, my classic Brood Brothers Imperial Guardsman. So to get this guy changed over to just being a regular human Imperial Guard, I'm pretty much just going to be repainting a little bit of skin there. 
And then I have uh, about 10 of these old school penal troopers, which are gonna be used as, um, uh, what are they called now? Uh, basically like a volunteer force or white shields. Renegade, so the Psyker girl protects him from psychic interrogation. <laughs> Uh, conscripts, yes, thank you. So I'm gonna be using these guys as conscripts along with some good old Catachans, who are not yet painted. And uh, I thought Catachans as conscripts works pretty well. They kind of look like militia, kind of. But, um, and then the other thing I have here is some of these, uh, what are they called, laser destroyers? Uh, my friend 3D printed these for me and they are pretty cool, heavy support option. Uh, the only thing he didn't print was the actual thing that goes right here. So I had to make that out of plastic card and it's just kind of plain. Needs at least some kind of screen or something, targeting screen on the back or some buttons. But each one has, I have three of them and each one has a little uh, pilot or driver gunner, I guess on the back. And so I do need to also paint those guys. For my conscripts, I got purity seals on them to show the raw recruits rule. Oh, that's that's interesting. Cool. And I have one really fun character here. Let me see if I can find him. Oh, I do also have this, uh, what do you call this? Uh, I'm using it as an astropath, but it's a navigator from Blackstone Fortress. And if I just paint the hands, it will be good for a human character. Let me see if I can find the very fun character I have in here. Uh, here's another astropath. I painted this one on cam a while ago and he does look very alien, but we're gonna paint him to look human. And it looks like I also have a few heavy weapon teams on here. They need the same treatment. Ah, here's a couple interesting characters. So here is the um, Adeptus Arbites Judge, who I painted on cam to be a Gene Stealer cult um, neophyte leader. And I'm going to use him for some kind of Imperial Guard character. I just need to basically repaint that little bit of skin around his mouth and he'll be done. So that's that's something easy I could get done tonight. But here's a fun character, Commander Brand. This guy's been through a bunch of iterations. I'm gonna be using him as like a platoon commander. But of course, Commander Brand is named after a young Warhammer player who died of cancer a few years ago and um, made kind of a stir in the community as people were rallying around him as he was undergoing treatment. Unfortunately, he he didn't make it, but uh, we're remembering good old Brand uh, with this miniature. And he started out as Astra Militarum, I actually used, um, uh, what's the uh, Katachan guy with the um, metal arm? I used him as Straken at first, and then he joined the uh, Gene Stealer cult and I used him as like a part of a heavy weapon crew and now he's going back to the Imperial Guard and we're gonna keep him as Commander Brand but that'll be fun to see him fighting uh, for a loyalist faction again. Oh you've got this guy too huh? Or maybe you're talking about one of the others where you're talking about this guy, the judge. All right, so those are some of the things on our to-do list here that shouldn't be too tough. Oh, the Navigator. Oh yeah, this guy from Blackstone Fortress. I love this miniature. I think he's very cool. I was quite pleased with how mine came out. Uh, it's really fun to see all the different ways people uh, paint this character on um, Instagram. I did a search for like his, his name. Renegade says, my Psyker girl is uh, Arcadia uh, Madeline from Blackstone Fortress. I know the miniature you're talking about. Uh, Blackstone Fortress uh, Primaris Psyker. I think. Well, um, 
I think what I want to do is actually get out a bunch of these miniatures I'm going to be painting and kind of line them up and work on them batch style. But um, maybe we'll start with the uh, laser destroyers. Laser destroyers and the heavy weapon teams are the ones that kind of take up a bunch of space. We'll, we'll set them out of the way for now. And I'm so happy with it. <laughs> That's great, Renegade. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and stage up some of these uh, already painted guys who just need their skin tone changed. And then we'll kind of work through them batch style. How much time have we got? It's about eight o'clock. I've got a few hours I could work on this, so plenty of time. Quite possible I'll get through all these tonight because this is gonna go pretty quick once we dive into it. Uh, my plan is basically to start out with one skin tone and then just gradually change it to, to make sort of a variety of skin tones. So we'll start with a more white looking skin and then gradually fade to more black or something like that. Mix in a little yellow, mix in a little brown, and that way we'll get a nice variety of skin tones. All right, probably about 40 miniatures we're going to be working on here. I think that's all the ones who are actually basically finished. So it'll be a nice head start on my Imperial Guard Army if we can get through all these. I think we'll have basically a conscript squad and uh, two astropaths, laser destroyers, and uh, two infantry squads. Something like that. Just gonna go ahead and put them in maybe rows of 10. Uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. That way we'll be able to kind of track our progress through these. So I talked about the lore or army narrative for my dark angels uh, basically i guess uh, i will give you a little bit more about them uh, my dark angels were responsible for protecting an imperial shrine in the icarus system on transcendence moon and i had the idea that basically every 10 years they would come back to the system they would just send a ship to the system and they would pick up the 10 Dark Angel Space Marines who had been protecting the shrine and drop off 10 more who are going to spend the next 10 years there. So it would basically be a posting, 10 year posting for 10 Dark Angels on Transcendence Moon protecting the shrine. And it was probably a pretty good gig because uh, Transcendence Moon was kind of a, a pleasure moon or garden moon where it was like the nicest place in the solar system and all the richest hive denizens would move there if they could afford it. But then when uh, Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade attacked the system, the shrine was attacked uh, by uh, Black Legion and the Dark Angels defending it were killed and the shrine was des uh, desecrated and eventually it was sort of left abandoned and now the Dark Angels have returned to the system a hundred years later, but the actual location of the shrine has been sort of lost to history and is waiting to be rediscovered and rebuilt and restored, I guess. So that's now you're kind of up to speed on, on the Dark Angels. Uh, so the next army that I started playing, uh, let me actually find a good flesh tone for this as, and then I can be painting as I talk. Uh, the next army I started playing was Dark Angel, or uh, Drukhari, or Dark Eldar. And the way I got into Dark Eldar was just that a friend of mine at Starbucks, uh, where I was working, told me that uh, he had a box of uh, 
Warhammer miniatures in his parents' attic, and did I want it? And I'm like, hell yeah. And he said they were dark something, so I was actually expecting that he had dark angels. And I was rather surprised when he showed up with a box of old school dark Eldar from, like, I think, was it uh, second or third edition? When um, the box set contained plastic dark Eldar, those were kind of the era of models that he had. All right, we're going to start with uh, good old Kislev flesh here. And we'll be painting probably the whitest, palest of the guardsmen to start. And I think I actually want a smaller brush. And we're going to keep the paint pretty thick. And hopefully be able to do this almost in just one coat. And by keeping the paint really thick, we can kind of dry brush it on, hopefully without too much problem. Uh, I suppose we should zoom in a bit. There we go. And hopefully I can keep the miniature somewhat centered. All right. So for my uh, Drukari, uh, I guess from that introduction, you'll gather that I didn't exactly choose to play, play Drukari. It was more sort of thrust upon me as my friend gave me this start collecting box from, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, or earlier and um, that was just kind of like a nice excuse to start collecting a new faction uh, we are probably going to want to do a, an ink wash on these after a uh, base coat of flesh color um, and uh I had never really thought about playing Drukhari, or Dark Eldar as they were called at the time. Uh, although I kind of liked the idea of having like a quote unquote evil faction to play against um, Space Marine players and that kind of thing. You know, if you play Warhammer 40k, you kind of know that there's a lot of Space Marine players out there. It's probably the most popular faction. And one of the things you run into is like you and your friends all play Imperium. And so you're constantly having to play Imperium versus Imperium type battles. And I was kind of lucky that I had a friend who was playing mostly Chaos at this time. So I didn't exactly have that problem, but uh, I guess I did have another friend who played uh, Dark Angels. And I've also had friends where I gave them some of my Dark Angels to kind of get them into the game. And so it's kind of nice to have a evil, quote unquote, evil faction to play against Space Marines. So I did keep the uh, Dark Eldar and decided to make them my second army. And of course I added quite a bit onto the models I got for free. You know, your your first hit's free, but then you gotta pay. So I, I ultimately um, expanded my Drukari quite a bit. Uh, started with uh, basically a Cabal Force, but I eventually expanded into Cult and Coven, which are basically the three sub-factions of Drukari. Your um, Cabal is like your basic Dark Eldar Warriors led by an Archon. Your cult are like uh, gladiatorial fighters who are kind of the celebrities of the Dark City and just uh, love nothing more than perfecting the art of combat and showing off their skills. This guy's hand isn't even connected to his arm. Not the kind of thing you're gonna notice though when you're looking at a squad of 10 models and can't really tell from the looking down from above. So whatever, not a problem. And then uh, Coven are your sort of like uh, your sort of mad scientists and their creations or evil mad doctors kind of. And uh, I, although I was happy to play a, a sort of evil faction, I wasn't really a big fan of the sort of evil character of the Drukhari. And I kind of 
you know, I always liked Eldar. I kind of wanted to have a little more of a Eldar vibe to my Dark Eldar. So I kind of came up with my own twist on Drukhari after reading a bit uh, from the Codex about their lore that basically my Archon was going to be descended from old Eldari nobility as the Dark Eldar, basically the remnants of the old Emp Eldar Empire, which uh, was destroyed when the Eye of Terror and uh, the Chaos God Slanesh were created. And um, most of the uh, Dark Eldar sort of started out as Eldar survivors of the old empire who retreated into the webway to escape from Slanesh. Okay, Renegade knows the lore. So my idea was that my Cabal was basically going to be led by an Archon who was not a fan of the sort of depravity of the uh, Dark City. That he move there to sort of escape destruction, but he's always kind of resented how evil and corrupt the Dark Eldar have become. And so, although he is a denizen of the Dark City, he doesn't like to spend time there, and he actually spends as much time as possible in real space on very long real space raids that last for weeks or months. And um, it's kind of a problem for Drukhari because Slanesh is always hungering for their souls and you kind of get the impression that if they spend too long in real space, then Slaneshi demons will start to materialize around them, sort of like sniff them out kind of thing. So my uh, sort of explanation for how they survive in real space aboard their spaceships is that they use a combination of like drugs that totally mellow them out and suspended animation so they basically just hibernate and um, and sort of like very strict discipline in order to basically keep the hunger of Slanesh uh, away or stay hidden from it and some of the like ideas I had is like they keep their weapons locked up so they can't even look at them until it's time to like literally go fight so that they don't, you know, manifest Slanesh just by looking at their weapons and feeling the temptation of battle and that kind of thing. So I have all their weapons painted pink, like, uh, kind of like um, sex toys or something to sort of indicate that they're like a source of pleasure and therefore shouldn't be, you know, it's like a warning color kind of. Yeah, kind of similar to what they do on Craft Worlds, but with a little more of a violent evil kind of uh, vibe to it I was going for. The the craft wilders are more into like meditation and controlling their impulses uh, intentionally and of their own accord where my Drukhari would be more about strict discipline and um, very tight regulations of what's allowed on the ship and that kind of thing. And I chose the... Um, for their rules, I chose the Cabal Poison Tongue. And I wanted to have my own name, but basically use rules from one of the main Cabals. So I named them Cabal of the Void Hunter, which I figured would just be the, na the sort of title of my uh, Archon. So he's too edgy for the craft world and too edgy for Kamara. Uh, yeah, pretty much. That's a good way to put it. Uh, so I call him the Void Hunter and kind of to indicate that he spends his time in real space hunting. And uh, the Cabal that I chose, which is um, Poison Tongue, has basically a bonus to their poison weapons. And it's kind of like they have the best poisons in Kamara. So I incorporated that into my army lore, taking inspiration from the codex or from my uh, sub-faction, basically, and figured that uh, they are all about hunting across the furthest reaches of real space for the best poisons and the rarest, most exotic beasts. So 
that was how I kind of combined the um, the rules of my subfaction with the lore that I was building for my cabal. And I kind of uh, came up with my witch cult is kind of an extension of that. I named them the Cult of the Black Lotus and basically figured they would be all about searching real space or the farthest reaches of real space for the most potent drugs and also for beasts for um, for their Archon, the Void Hunter, because uh, technically the beast masters and beast squads are, are part of the uh, cult, not the... Um, not the Cabal. Sounds like an Altioch Ranger. Oh yeah, a little bit. Interesting. I've always uh, thought Eldar would be fun to collect and paint. I love the models. I've always loved the models, especially like the Exarch, uh, what do they call them? Uh, not the Exarch, the, uh, like the different Path Warriors. And the, um, speeder bikes and stuff and the farseers a lot of great models in the eldar range i think even the old ones <laughs> cabal of the edgelord beast hunters drug runners and poison seekers pretty much well once i had kind of developed the lore that far that they go on the longest real space raids then i kind of uh was able to sort of uh, make the lore a little bit deeper by thinking, okay, what what would happen if you had a Cabal that went on the longest real space raids? And I figured that the Cabal would really attract any Drukari who are trying to get out of the Dark City. So basically, um, that would be like enemies of, of Vect, the Lord of the Dark City, and Drukari who had like committed crimes and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, I guess it's, there's not really a lot of like crimes you can commit in Kumra, but basically like people who were marked for death or had uh, pissed off the wrong person or the wrong cabal in Kumra would, uh, would seek out this cabal and sign up for one of their super extended real space raids just as a way to hide out. But on the other hand, it's they're very clear in the lore that basically nothing happens in Kamara without the approval of Vect, including like, n n you know, almost like not one raid gets launched without Vect's say so, which means that as much as uh, this cabal might be full of enemies of Vect, it also operates and goes on these extended raids with his approval. So. Uh, I kind of like the idea that Vect kind of lets them go on these long raids, knowing that they're going to, like, take his enemies out of the Dark City and basically keep them out of trouble for, you know, a year at a time or longer. And I kind of like the idea that also when they finally do return to the Dark City, uh, Vect is often, like, literally waiting at the docks of their, uh, you know, uh, Cabal headquarters to greet them in person and, uh, you know, he may even have his, like, kill squads with him waiting for specific individuals who they're just going to murder the second uh, the Cabal shows up. So, uh, as a result, I've kind of, like, uh, settled on my Cabal being almost like enemies of, the, of Blackheart. And so I never was into taking, like, a single Blackheart patrol or those kind of tactics that people have uh, been using for a while which are, they're not going to be able to anymore as uh, they just got rid of the ability to mix uh, sub-factions. <laughs> if we zoom in really close on this guy, he's got a super derpy face. Uh, let's get him in focus. <laughs> uh, classic uh, derpy uh, guardsman eyes here. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. I never knew how bad they looked till I saw them close up. All right, let's just paint over those eyes, shall we? Nothing lost. Uh-oh, this brush is getting kind of a split tip here. Well, I tried to paint over his eyes, but I feel like you can still see him. 
That's funny. Guess I did water down my paint. Uh, well, when it came to, um, oh, okay. Renegade, they got to sell rare ingredients to the homunculi in return for supplies and safe haven in Kamara. Well, when it came to my, um, oof. When it came to my coven, I, I wasn't really a fan of the sort of style of coven models. I didn't really like the sort of torture victim aesthetic where they've all got their skin flayed off and they're like, um, uh, you know, what's the word? Flayed, I guess. And I wanted to do something really different for my coven. And I was interested in running grotesques which are basically like your big bruisers for uh, Coven. But I didn't want to use the standard models. And I kind of wanted to substitute something more alien that would kind of uh, reinforce the feeling that these guys travel to the farthest reaches of the galaxy. And would kind of uh, hopefully make the universe feel bigger like there's more different kinds of weird alien creatures present so uh after doing you know sort of i, I don't i guess i actually did go and and do some research of like what are different weird alien races in 40k besides the ones that are already have whole factions like orcs and eldar and uh tyranids and i came across an old rogue trader miniature which is called a the original miniature was called a piscean warrior meaning kind of like a fish man warrior and kind of looked like a cross between a person and a shark and uh, they're also called saharduin s-a-h-a-r-d-u-i-n and i thought oh this is this is exactly what i'm looking for i want to run like saharduin mercenaries or something as my grotesques and since there wasn't there was only one miniature for them made way back in the rogue trader days i actually ended up sculpting my own out of green stuff and i'd love to say they were like super professional but honestly they looked kind of crap but uh for a couple years i was running my grotesques as these sort of homemade hand sculpted uh, Saharduin or Piscean warrior mercenaries. And then I eventually found the perfect models to replace them with that would keep the same idea but look a lot better. Which were um, from a out of print game called Wrath of Kings. Oh, okay, you saw that. So uh, I actually used these Wrath of Kings pit fighters and they're like, um, they're shark men. And I just modified them so that they would have the loadout that would be correct for, um, for uh, what are they called? Uh, grotesques. So grotesques have a flesh gauntlet, which is like they have a hand cut off and like a, a spike on it instead. So I did that to all the uh, pit fighters. I basically figured that if their worlds are blockaded by the Imperial Navy and the only way they can get off their planet is to like sign up with the Dark Eldar, that my uh, coven would basically require a payment of one hand and several years of service. So in order to get off their planet and join my space fleet, they have to sacrifice one of their hands for science and it gets replaced with a sort of like punch dagger basically, or like a hook or a spike or whatever. And then they wield a sword or giant cleaver in their other hand. So that's my coven and I named them the uh, for their rules, I went with the Coven of Twelve, and I renamed them Coven of the Drowned Worlds to basically 
reference the fact that they come from ocean planets. And I use some uh, Wrath of Kings Hadros characters for my uh, homunculi who kind of look like they're sort of like a cross between a, a human and a jellyfish or something with like kind of a bulbous body and like tentacles and um, my sort of lore explanation is that they're Drukari homunculi who have modified their own bodies to become amphibious in order to live on these ocean worlds where they recruit these uh, Saharduin from. So that's the lore of my Drukari, uh, the uh, army lore or the army narrative. And um, it was inspired mostly by reading Games Workshop lore in my codex, uh, partly from my my choices of which uh, Cabal and Coven, etc., that I wanted to play. I do run the Cult of the Black Lotus, my uh, witch cult as... Um, Cult of Strife. I liked the rules the best for them. And they do have some actual like uh, relics that let them do extra drugs and that kind of stuff. So it's kind of fitting also. But that is my Drukhari. And the next faction that I started playing was Gene Stealer Cult. And the way that uh, I got into that was basically I had um, some Gene Stealers sitting in a box for years and years from the Space Hulk board game. I had bought Space Hulk in order to convert the Terminators to be Deathwing Terminators for my Dark Angels. And I had the Gene Stealers sitting in a box for years. I eventually got around to painting them up but still just left them sitting in a box. And we had this narrative where Transcendence Moon got attacked by the uh, Black Legion during Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade when they desecrated the Imperial uh, Shrine and the Dark Angels ultimately abandoned the planet. And a Tyranid hive ship, or a scout ship, I mean, had crashed down on the planet. And then we had this uh, break in the campaign where the narrative was advancing in 40k uh, in general. The Primaris Marines had become a thing, and Gilliman was back awake, and all of uh, Call's Belisarius calls uh, technological creations and started to make their way out into the wider Imperium. And so that was a point where we decided to introduce a 100 year time gap into our campaign and say, okay, the Dark Angels are returning to the system 100 years later. And the campaign or the uh, star system has pretty much been, the Icarus system has been pretty much left in ruins for 100 years. Uh, well, it was kind of in, in that context that I started working on my Gene Stealer cult. And I had the idea that they would be the cult which had taken over Transcendence Moon after its hives had been emptied out during the uh, Black Crusade. Uh, during our sort of narrative games, we had played a game where the local Imperial populace had all evacuated their hives and were boarding evacuation ships to leave the moon and then uh, Black Legion actually came down and attacked the spaceport and captured all of the evacuation ships with all the population on board and we figured this would only leave behind about maybe 5% of the Imperial population who had either not been allowed to evacuate or had missed the evacuation or something like that Ah, we made it to the, uh, what is he, the uh, astropath. Let's make this guy look a little more human. So uh, with just 5% of the population remaining in the hives, we figured if there was some kind of maybe small gene stealer cult presence on the moon, they would basically, this would be their day of ascension or that would have been their day of ascension. And for a hundred years, they would have basically 
conquered all the hives on Transcendence, which had about maybe, I think about six different Imperial hives on the moon. So I uh, had some Imperial Guard, some of these very Imperial Guard right here, uh, kicking around. And so I painted them up as Gene Sealer Cult Brood Brothers. And I combined them with the uh, Gene Stealers from Space Hulk, led by good old Commander Brand, uh, leading the Brood Brothers. And that became the beginning of my uh, Gene Stealer Cults. And so they, uh, from a narrative point of view, uh, they were going to be the cult which had sprung up on Transcendence Moon and basically conquered the whole moon in the absence of any Imperium presence. And so uh, it was pretty easy to come up with a name for them. I just called them the Gene Stealer Cult of Transcendence, which uh, I liked because it had kind of like a kind of like a nice ring to it, like they're good guys almost, you know, the cult of transcendence, you know, it sounds sounds like kind of high-minded and enlightened, uh, but really it's just the name of the moon that they're based on. But from a recruiting point of view, you know, it sounds, sounds so nice. Join the cult of transcendence. Your life will never be the same. All right, we're... Getting a little heavy handed with the paint here, but eh, it's working out. So, uh, let's see. For my hive cult, I settled on the Twisted Helix cult. And it actually kind of made sense when I read about them. Um, Twisted Helix are like the medical specialist cult with the most like knowledge of science and medicine. And one of the ways that they spread their infection throughout the galaxy is by like sending out like tainted medical supplies and stuff like that where when people take the uh, you know medicines or vitamins that they've infected they'll turn in start to turn into gene sealers or whatever so uh, from a kind of lore point of view that kind of made certain amount of sense that this like very high class Imperial Moon, if it was going to be tainted by a Gene Sealer cult, it kind of made sense that it would be this one which um, infects through subterfuge. And uh, I could totally imagine that um, Transcendence Moon could have received a shipment of tainted medical supplies at some point. That could be how the infection first started there. And then, um, that has come up a little bit in uh, our game since. We actually just played a game uh, set on another planet in the same system where my uh, Dark Angels were fighting against Eldar and the narrative uh, setup for the battle that we came up with was that there was a tainted shipment of medical supplies that had just been delivered to the planet Icarus 2 and it had been sent from Transcendence Moon and it was infected with the Gene Stealer virus. So the uh, Eldar had foreseen this and sensed that the planet was going to fall to the Gene Stealer infection unless they made all haste to destroy that medical shipment. And uh, that was the, the battle that we fought was uh, the uh, Eldar attacking the spaceport to destroy the boxes containing the uh, infected medical supplies. And they succeeded. So they actually saved the planet, saved the people of Icarus too. But uh, that was kind of part of the uh, uh, army narrative that, that came out of uh, reading the codex and picking uh, Twisted Helix. Uh, so even though I have a custom name for them and a kind of a custom lore, uh, I still get some inspiration from the Codex. Hey, welcome, uh, Clip Fiskin, first time chatter. Welcome to the channel. Uh, choice of God, interesting. Uh, are you asking me if I chose a Chaos God in 40K, which one would I choose? My answer would be Zinch. But uh, if that's not what you're asking, let me uh, clarify a bit. 
and we're just kind of talking um, army narrative. Been talking through how I kind of came to the narrative I use for some of my 40k factions. Started with my Dark Angels. Oh, that is what you're asking. Okay, cool. Why Zinch? All right. Um, I think uh, I like the idea of being crafty and cunning. And uh, my favorite uh, 40k demons are the ones that split into smaller and smaller demons, the like uh, the horrors. And uh, I think the uh, Lord of Change is pretty cool looking greater demon. What would your uh, choice be, Clip Fiskin? And do you play uh, Chaos in 40k? And do you play any other factions? Kairosis Bay. You're a Nurgleite. Oh, cool. Well, uh, it would be really cool to have a Nurgle player in my uh, campaign. We have a planet, uh, Icarus 3, which is like a plague world. And we've actually not played any games there since it became one. Uh, I guess it's technically like a forbidden world uh, as far as the Imperium is concerned. But uh, during Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade, which was kind of a um, series of games, or it was sort of like the the center of a narrative I was playing with my uh, Chaos playing friend for a while uh, in the Icarus system which is our campaign setting we played a game on Icarus 3 which was a hive planet had I think about 10 or 12 different hive cities on it and in this battle uh, my friend was going to be playing uh, what's his name Typhus the Death Guard character so as kind of set up for the battle, I, I just sort of suggested, what if Typhus has unleashed a plague virus on this planet and the Dark Angels have been sent to investigate and that's how these forces end up fighting each other. So we played a game and my Dark Angels won, uh, which uh, actually that was the only time I've ever played against Typhus. My friend never brought him in another game after that. But uh, presumably he moved on to go infect other worlds. But we went ahead and kept that narrative for Icarus 3 that it was totally wiped out by, by uh, Typhus's zombie plague. And, uh, and then later we introduced a 100 year time gap into the uh, campaign. So basically 100 years ago, Typhus wiped out Icarus two, uh, 3 with a zombie plague and nobody's ever been back there since. So just kind of made sense that it would have become like a Nurgle planet or a Nurgle garden world or whatever they call it. And it would be really cool to have a uh, Nurgle player in the campaign to return to Icarus three and play against like a Nurgle demon army. I think that would be really cool. Or maybe it's been turned into like a uh, Death Guard Fortress World or something like that. Clip Fiskin says, I only do Ultramarines gameplay wise, but lore, Death Guard. Typhus to Traveler. I've got a Death Guard army and custodies because it's cheap. Oh, cool. That's really neat. Uh, so that one time was the only time my Chaos friend who, who collects all different Chaos stuff, that was the one time he brought um, Death Guard and Typhus, but uh, it would be cool to have a player who played um, Nurgle Demons, and we actually do have a player in the campaign now who has Custodes, I believe. I have not played against them yet, but uh, we are likely to see some Custodes coming up here on the channel in the, in the month to come, perhaps. Uh, our new thing here on Challenger Tabletop is playing... Uh, live games of 40k on Saturdays and Tuesdays and so far we've had uh, my Dark Angels, my Orcs, also uh, playing against Eldar, Templars, and uh, Sisters of Battle. But uh, I think we're going to be playing Necrons tomorrow, probably uh, around starting game around 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific Time. And I've heard that we're going to have some uh, Custodes showing up in the future, too. So stay tuned for that. 
Which faction if you had to choose two? Well, uh, are you saying for me? I play Dark Angels, Drukari, Gene Steeler Cults, and Orcs. And um, right now, if I had to sell two of my armies and I could only keep two, I would probably switch to this Imperial Guard army I'm working on right now. And as for which I'm most excited about between Drukari, Orcs, and Gene Stealer Cult, because I would want to have at least one non-Imperium army. Uh, I've been really loving Orcs, but since the Codex is coming out right now, I would probably say Gene Stealer Cult and Imperial Guard, if I had to pick two. I've, I've, uh, I sort of consider myself a Dark Angels player at heart. I've been playing them the longest, but at the same time, I've played so much Dark Angels, I could, I could live with uh, moving on to something new. And uh, I love my Drukari, but um, I also have played them a lot. They my, were my second fa uh, faction that I got into. So I also wouldn't mind if I didn't get to play them anymore. But I do like them quite a bit. And I am going to be painting some Drukari coming up pretty soon here. Maybe next week even. I've got uh, some out of print old school characters the old school drazar and the old school lelith hexbrex which i've kind of updated with some modern weapons and i'm going to be painting those as well as a uh, squad of witches including some old school witches i think i've got about 16 of them to paint so that should be fun I mostly do lore and lion tickles my pickle. Lion? Do you mean uh, the lion? Like um, Lionel Johnson from the Dark Angels. That's kind of what jumps out at me. So I've talked about my lore for my Dark Angels, my Drukari, and my Gene Stealer cults. That just leaves orcs and then the future project here that I'm working on as we speak, my uh, Imperial Guard. Left to talk about. Oh, okay, you like the lion. That's awesome. He is my Primarch as a Dark Angel. I'm definitely looking forward to getting the lion back on the tabletop, hopefully in the next, what, five years? Is that enough time, Games Workshop? You're really taking your time bringing him out. They've been uh, teasing the lion now for at least five years. And uh, I have a prediction for you, uh, Clip Fiskin. Lion is a taciturn asshat. You know, I like to think that the lion is the closest thing we have to the emperor still living in the 40k galaxy today. I think that the lion is almost like the emperor himself minus his psychic powers. And I wouldn't, the way he has kind of like one of the more pure gene seeds, I wouldn't be surprised if the Emperor's own DNA was involved in the creation of the lion. Well, I guess it was involved in all the Primarchs to some extent, wasn't it? But uh, I think the, the Emperor tried to sort of fix his, himself by removing the psychic powers and create the lion that way. Oh, Sanguinius though. Yeah, well, Sanguinius was pretty tainted to have wings. And uh, his gene seed has got some kind of vampire taint to it, too. Plus, he's not literally alive in the Imperium today, either. But uh, my prediction for the lion is that he will return. And if you remember how we had Sanguinius represents his nobility. Oh, okay. I think the... Uh, the lion is the most like the emperor because the emperor was very secretive also. Although the emperor was maybe more maybe more creative than the lion, but uh, just like the emperor set out to sort of pacify the galaxy and turn it into a prosperous empire, the lion really kind of did that on Caliban, pacified the planet, uh, led a crusade against all of the great beasts successfully. 
All right, well, I think it's time to start um, mixing this. Uh, well, let's just switch to this uh, XV88 base and do this as a skin color for some guys. He also let Luther get froggy. Well, isn't that kind of uh, like a analogy for what happened with the Emperor? So just like the Emperor and Horus, it's almost like a mirror of that happened with, uh, with um, the lion and Luther. I think that actually makes him more like, more like the Emperor. But uh, if you remember when we got the first Primarch released, Gilliman, and I want to say he was in a triumvirate box with um, that Inquisitor, Greyfax, and um, it was Gilliman, Greyfax, and Cipher, right? If I remember right. So I feel like they're going to do the same thing if they release um, the lion, where he'll come out in a box with three characters. And my prediction is that it would be the lion, Luther, because we've heard Luther's alive and he escaped from the rock. And are you ready for it? Um, <laughs> oh, the triumvirate was Celestine, Greyfax, and Call. Thank you. No, I did not remember that, Renegade. I didn't buy it, and it was a while ago. Thank you for correcting me. Okay, so did I at least get... Oh, wasn't... Uh... Wasn't Gilliman part of the triumvirate? No? Hmm. I thought Gilliman came out in a box with two other characters. And that was the only way you could buy him. I don't I don't think it was Call. Don't you think it was Celestine, Greyfax, and Gilliman? I could be wrong. Uh but what if Korax stopped being an emo raven soy boy? Oh, is Korax, where is Korax? I'm not even aware of that. Anyway, my, my prediction on who we'd have in a box would be the lion, Luther, and uh, Lehman Russ. I think Lehman Russ will come back and the dark angels will be declared traitors based on something that Lehman Russ has found out maybe, but that Lehman Russ will also have mutated and become like part werewolf. So we'll, we'll get Lehman Russ, but he'll be almost like a demon prince. He'll be like a giant werewolf Lehman Russ after being, uh, what, in the warp or somewhere or the eye of terror for too long. And, uh, so the storyline will be something about like Lehman Russ is like hunting down uh, uh, Lionel Johnson, who's also hunting down Luther to try to prove his innocence or something like that. And there will be like a civil war within the Imperium where dark angels are declared traitors, but they're literally still loyal. And you'll have Imperium forces fighting against each other, maybe sort of all orchestrated by Luther and the Fallen, who will also be more of a faction with Luther introduced as a as a uh, Fallen character. Okay, well that's my my crazy prediction for the for the release of the Lion. Um Renegade says clearly you need some lore with your lore so you can make some lore. Clipfiskin, when Russ returns, he'll basically be Odin. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that'd be cool. Uh, Renegade, and he's about Imperium Secundus, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I saw a great idea that Russ comes back missing an eye, like Odin, gaining wisdom. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, I would actually love it if he came back and he had two models. So there's like Odin Lehman Russ, and then there's like Werewolf Lehman Russ. And when you get him down to zero wounds, he like turns into his bestial form instead of dying. I think that would be really fun. So have like a transforming model on the tabletop. Um, and Clip Fiskin, I always hated Russ because he comes off as a thinly veiled noble savage 
Now, Lionel Johnson kind of has that noble savage thing going too. Uh, I want Constantine Valdor. Interesting. I'll have to read some about him. I actually don't know much about him. I've heard the name before. Oh, here's uh, Chef. <laughs> this uh, sergeant is named after Chef from uh, Tabletop Tactics. Love that guy. Chef, Spider, and I miss Bone. Bone was always so much fun to watch. Hope that guy's doing really well. Hope he found a nice lady or something. Or at least he's still playing 40k. Uh, Renegade, GW likes sidekick models. He'll have pet Fenrisian wolves. No doubt, that would be cool. Uh, Forge World has Valdor. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, but if you know the latest lore from the Dan Abnett book, Valdor isn't coming back. Uh-oh. Um, Clip Fiskin, his role as Yellow King in novels, though. Renegade, yeah, that was a really good twist. All right, here we go. Uh, maybe I should make um, Chef really pale, <laughs> uh, since he's named after a real person here, who is very pale. Really struggling against my uh, split ends on this brush. I need to take better care of my brushes. Never been very good at that. I don't know how people have enough self-control to keep the paint out of the uh, quick or roots of their brush. All right, well, um, that Eisenhorn Trilogy. Uh, Renegade says it's like uh, Quixos and Malice, Malleus. So I don't have a whole lot of lore for my orcs, but uh, I named my war boss. Uh, I, I do play Goths, and I named my war boss Lord Humongous, inspired by the character in Mad Max. Um, or is it, uh, I think, Road Warrior, actually. So the first movie was Mad Max, and the second movie was Road Warrior, and then the rest of them were all named Mad Max whatever, Beyond Thunderdome, uh, Fury Road, etc. But in Road Warrior was the first one that was really, like, post-apocalyptic, and they had a uh, this uh, sort of goofy villain who's, like, wearing almost like a thong or like bondage gear or something and he has like a hockey mask i think and he's named lord humongous and i thought that was a awesome name perfect for like an orc war boss where pretty much the the biggest boss or the biggest orc will become the boss so lord humongous seemed like a pretty appropriate name and in reading about orc culture and sort of uh wa you know, formation, I read that a lot of times a boss, sort of an underboss who gets too big will be sort of sent away to go lead a wah somewhere else uh, so that he doesn't get big enough that he actually challenges the war boss. And so I figured that would be sort of the idea with Lord Humongous is that he was getting too big and he was a goth fighting with uh, Gazkul Thraka and that Gazkul sort of sent him and a bunch of the other big underbosses away to go lead Waz on the far side of the galaxy. And um, the Icarus system, uh, which uh, is our like uh, made up setting for our narrative campaign, uh, does have a location in the 40k galaxy. It's uh, located in basically the far northwest of the galaxy, which is kind of a a play on uh, us being in the northwest of the United States here in Oregon. So it's located kind of between the Segmentum Pacificus and the Halo Stars, kind of like the 
northwestern edge of the galaxy. And so uh, sort of um, just kind of riffing off that, we've got the Pacific Ocean here and you've got Segmentum Pacificus in uh, 40K galaxy. So I named my WA the WA for the Pacific Rim which is kind of like uh, also a little bit of a play on the movie Pacific Rim. So that's the name of my WA, WA for the Pacific Rim and my war boss, Lord Humongous. Make him red for fast. Well, I went for black because it's easy to paint. I can prime my orcs black and they're already like half painted as goths. They apostrophe in, uh, they apostrophe the H in orc names. Ulanor Crusade Pride World Worldwide. So um, basically uh, sort of the, the narrative, I guess, for my orc wah is that they were sent by um, Gazkol to go conquer the western edge of the galaxy or the northwest or the Pacific Rim, I guess, as it were. And so uh, I've been, I did eventually get Gazkol, the model, uh, although I didn't have him when I was first coming up with this lore. So I kind of have the idea that like Gazkol is like not satisfied by the progress of their wah. Um, I've lost a lot of my games as orcs. So I kind of like the idea that Gazkol is on his way to come like check on the progress and so they're all like frantically trying to conquer as many planets as they can before Gaskell gets there because they're like really worried about how he's going to be, you know, dissatisfied when he arrives. And kind of inspired by Return of the Jedi when uh, uh, Lord Vader shows up at uh, the Death Star and he tells them that the Emperor is personally coming to inspect their progress and they need to hurry up and finish building it before he gets there and kind of the equi uh, equivalent character to Darth Vader for my WA would be uh, Lord, or I mean, uh, Boss Zagstruck. Zagstruck is a Storm Boy boss. Uh, so he has a jetpack and he has his own planet. He's like a very famous uh, orc boss, I guess. Uh, Goff as well. So basically he's arrived in the system in advance of Gazkol to basically try and whip the goths into shape and get uh what throw some fear into uh lord humongous and hopefully increase their progress we could all learn something from orcs says clip fiskin orcs don't do fran uh, frantics orcs just do their thing so yeah they've been fun um Oh, looks like I never painted this guy's right hand uh, gene sealer color. So uh, I guess the narrative for my orcs ever since they uh, started in the campaign, um, the first planet I figured that they would land on would be the one closest to the sun or the star, Icarus star, I guess it is in this campaign. And that's actually a barren planet, and one of its only features is a Space Hulk crash. So it kind of made sense that the orcs would uh, crash on that planet and set about uh, scavenging the wreck of the Space Hulk and turning it into war machines and ships to basically take off from Icarus 1 and go attack the other planets in the system. And as far as their first target, it made sense that they would just go ahead and attack the next planet over. So we've been fighting several battles with my orcs against uh, the forces on Icarus 2. And then uh, we played a few battles where the orcs are now attacking Icarus 4, which is also a pretty barren planet. It just has a secret weapons lab on it. So um, I was playing against uh, Mark one of my new friends who's uh, joined the Challenger tabletop team. And Mark plays a custom chapter of Templars using the Black Templars rules, 
which he calls the Templars of the Broken Shard. And his lore for them is that they are experts at fighting without Imperium support, and they scavenge and repair, you know, supplies on the battlefield. So they are one of the few Space Marine chapters that will totally pick up orc weapons and use them, you know, alongside the rest of their Astartes equipment. And they'll use, you know, jump packs and backpacks and other things that they find from other Space Marine chapters. And they just have kind of like a hodgepodge of gear that's almost like scrap gear. And since uh, they're operating on Icarus 4, he decided that that's actually the planet that they've been tasked to defend. And they're, they're like sworn to defend Icarus 4 and like never leave it. So that's been kind of fun. Uh, he's so far won two out of three games against my orcs and we've been playing at 1000 points and we've decided that on Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, we're going to play a 2000 point game as the Templars finally attack the orc landing site in an attempt to completely encircle and destroy the orcs at their staging ground. So. If he wins this third game in a row, he's going to have successfully fought the orcs off on Icarus 4 and will move on to play some other games around the campaign system, or else maybe I'll come attack him with some of my other forces, like uh, like my Drukhari or Gene Steeler cult. But that's been really fun. Um... Clip Fiskin, every uh, 40k faction seems to be having a trash time, minus orcs. It's kind of true. Orcs are having the most fun in, in the uh, 40k universe. I did a poll on Facebook, which is like, uh, who's, who's having the best time in 40k? And had like, you know, Nurgle, orcs, uh, Trazen, the players had a, a bunch of funny uh, choices, and I think Orcs won the poll, if I remember right. All right, painting uh, good old Commander Brand here. He's gonna have the sort of middle brown skin tone, looks like. Well, uh, fun is vital. Yeah, it is, Clip. All right, well, that leads us to my Imperial Guard. Uh, so when we had the announcement a couple weeks ago that a bunch of uh, the Brood Brothers options for Gene Sealer Cult were going to be going away, I was quite distraught because I'd ordered all kinds of stuff that I was planning to use for Brood Brothers, like, uh, like these fun 3D printed um, bull grins, for instance. And uh, basically, Gene Steeler cults weren't going to be allowed to have Bulgrins or Ogrins or a bunch of other stuff. Uh, or um, Astropaths. I had just painted several Astropaths for my uh, Gene Steeler cult, and I had ordered some uh, Engine Seers and stuff like that. So I was rather distraught that basically all my plans were being ruined by this new uh, codex. But uh, I posted about it on Facebook and I had a few people encourage me to just uh, take those units and turn them into a guard army. And once I thought about that a bit, I actually got quite excited about it. And uh, that was the birth of this new guard army that I'm working on as we speak, where basically I'm taking a bunch of stuff that was formerly Brood Brothers or originally planned to be Brood Brothers and I'm going to change it into just being loyal Imperial Guard. And of course, this is going to be a guard army which is set in the Icarus system. And I'm kind of in the process of working on the lore for them. And I thought you guys might be able to uh, give me some feedback, maybe some ideas and inspiration. So that's kind of the last subject we have to talk about tonight or that I had planned. Uh, Clip Fiskin says, but philosophically, I can only get down with custodies. Cadia stands. So 
uh, I do have a lot of the sort of Cadian bodies here, but I don't really want to play them as Cadians, partly because I feel like if Cadia has been destroyed, it doesn't really make sense to have Cadians fighting in like every single guard army that you ever see. And uh, granted, um, Icarus system is relatively close to the Eye of Terror, so it's conceivable that Cadians would be sent there or already stationed there. But I'm thinking that instead, uh, the two things I'm kind of considering, one is that they would be like a planetary defense force. That was my first idea. And I, I've always loved the idea of planetary defense force as like a theme for a guard army. But uh, as I kind of thought about it, I do want these Imperial Guard to at least be flying around the Icarus system, fighting on the different planets in the campaign. So I'm not, I don't necessarily want them to be just set on Icarus 2, for instance, which is where we've been uh, fighting most of our games recently. And... Um, the way I have a lot of their equipment is painted like Mechanicus Red. It could make sense that they're getting their equipment from Rast Moon, which is a Mechanicus Moon in the campaign system. Or else possibly it was manufactured there long ago and it's just been red ever since. But um, my first idea was Planetary Defense Force and uh, it wouldn't prevent me from having them on multiple planets as Either they could be like a mobilized planetary defense force that's just sent from planet to planet, even though, you know, they're set on one planet. They just uh, get kind of, um, what, drafted to go fight on other planets in the same star system. Or I was actually thinking maybe they would be uh, an Imperial Guard regiment set in the Icarus system. And it's possible that maybe I could kind of blend those two ideas together, like they are a planetary defense force which has been mobilized into a new regiment, something like that. So maybe they start on Icarus 2 and they're, they started out as like the planetary defense force of Icarus 2, but as it gets sort of more Imperial reinforcement and supplies, they get turned into a regiment. I assume that's a thing that could happen. And maybe, maybe they become a regiment which is recruited from all the planets in the Icarus system. So they could have some like uh, conscripts from the wilderness savage world or savage moon of transcendence and from i guess actually there's not a lot of inhabited planets left in the system <laughs> after playing a campaign in this star system for like several years pretty much every planet's been destroyed icarus 2 was destroyed uh in, or ruined it was a uh, <clears throat> an agricultural world or agri world and uh Abaddon attacked it uh, and abducted the majority of the populace, like maybe 95%. And the ones, the sort of imperial populace who remained on the planet had to sort of downgrade their technology to survive. Uh, it kind of went from being a, a profitable, productive agri world to just being a, like a feudal world that was sort of barely getting by. But over the hundred years that have passed, I figure it's slowly started to recover and rebuild so it's quite possible that now they have enough population that they really could uh, supply troops to a, a regiment and uh, and then I have also some uh, scions that I'm going to be painting and I wanted them to have kind of a slightly different look to the guard maybe more closely tied to the Mechanicus planet in the system, Rast Moon. And it would kind of fit that the Imperial Guard have more basic equipment coming from Icarus 2, and that the Scions who are equipped on a Mechanicus world would have the hotshot las guns and basically better armor and better equipment. 
better training. So uh, I was trying to brainstorm some names and I came up with uh, Icarus Eagles and Rast Raptors. So that way you'd have kind of a bird theme for both, but, um, but also distinct names. And I'd have my Imperial Guard regiment painted in these sort of gray, brown, and black colors that you see here. And um, I'd do my uh, Scions from the Mechanicus world wearing red armor. That's kind of my, my rough plan. So what do you guys think of that? Any, any ideas for my Imperial Guard? Or for the Scions? How do you like the names? Uh, Icarus Eagles. It also kind of ties back to that old Greek story of Icarus having the wings and being able to fly. And it also connects to like the, the name of the system that they're recruited from. And the planet is called Icarus II, so it also kind of ties back to their home planet. Do I think the Russia-Ukraine situation will be like Cadia? Wow. Talk about uh, interesting inspiration for an army. I have seen people do like US soldiers as Imperial Guardsmen or Space Marines. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if other people around the world have done their own countries as Warhammer 40K inspired uh, armies. Uh, I assume you're saying like like uh, Ukraine will fall, but the 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 Ukrainians will keep on fighting as the country breaks. And um, maybe they'll become like outcasts after their country gets captured and they'll be like regiments of um, Ukrainians still sort of loyal to their former country. Well, if uh, Russia does invade Ukraine, it seems like they'll have a hard time getting across the uh, the river that runs down the center of the country. Is it called... Um, I can't think of the name of the river, but it goes through Kiev, right? So I think that what makes sense is that there would be some sort of international defense along the line of the river and Russia could probably take Western Ukraine, but not the rest. That would be my prediction based on what I've studied so far. They're waiting for the ground to unfreeze. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because it seems like it would be easier to drive a tank over frozen ground than muddy ground. Plus, the Russians are like cold weather combat experts, right? It's certainly an interesting situation to uh, has the world kind of transfixed at the moment. I just saw today that the United States has moved their troops to neighboring countries, but not actually into Ukraine, which seems kind of weird. Uh, the supply lines? Okay. Hmm. In the uh, campaign we're playing, Abaddon has returned to the Icarus system. And uh, it was kind of fun brainstorming like what that would be like because he abducted all these civilians from the system and then a hundred years passed and now he's returning. So presumably a lot of the civilians that he captured would have become cultists or even chaos space marines. And uh, the ones who became cultists would have died of old age probably by now. 
And so the cultists who would be attacking the system with Abaddon would actually be like probably the grandchildren of the ones who he actually abducted from there. But then again, if uh, the ones who got turned into Chaos Space Marines, they'd probably still be the same ones returning back to this system that they haven't, that they remember from their time as an ordinary human a hundred years ago. So we figured that the Icarus system would almost be like legendary to his cultists because it would be something that they'd have heard about from their grandparents and never have actually seen with their own eyes until they come to literally attack it. We had a fun um, series of battles where they were attacking a an Imperial Fists base. My friend uh, who plays Black Legion was working on an Imperial Fists Primaris army based around heavy intercessors. And uh, his idea that he wanted to do for our games was that uh, basically his Imperial Fists were in an uh, underground vault, kind of like a like a a base. I'm gonna switch to some Gorthor Brown here for some of these guys. That uh, his Imperial Fists were basically in like suspended animation, like a lot of the Primaris were basically in cryo sleep for ten thousand years, and that uh, Abaddon had found the location of their base from talking to some of the people he abducted in the system a hundred years ago and had come back to attack it. So basically Abaddon was trying to get down to the lowest level of this base and blow it up to bury and destroy all these Primaris Marines before they could activate while my Dark Angels were trying to stop him basically. So we had this fun thing where it was like the race to the bottom of the vault where each game that we played was like one, lo one level deeper into this uh, underground mega base. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen Evangelion, uh, where they have the uh, like nerve city, where it's like a, a city in this massive cavern underground. But that's kind of what we were going for. Like these caves were so enormous that you could fly aircraft in them and stuff. And that was mostly just a decision so that you could bring whatever you like to the battle and not have to worry that, oh, we're fighting in a cave, you can't have aircraft or something like that. Usually we try to keep the narrative um, from interfering with the actual gameplay. So we try to let it sort of inspire the game, but we still play matched play. We don't restrict your army selection based on you know, a character died last game, so you can't take him or anything like that. Because basically we, we don't want the narrative to get in the way of the, the game. We want it to enhance it. Have you guys been playing some 40k lately? I think I already asked somebody this earlier. And if I haven't asked you already, are you doing any hobby stuff tonight? And do you have any other ideas for my Imperial Guard? Or do you like the names? Icarus Eagles, Rast Raptors. I think that's what I'm going to go with. Sounds like uh, Renegade thinks there's definitely going to be a war in Ukraine. All the signs seem to point towards it. Hard to believe that... Uh, Russia would have any reason to bluff. 
unless they're playing four-dimensional chess. Or anything you're um, predicting for the future of 40K storyline. And uh, do you have any ideas for your own army's uh, lore? Talked about that with some people earlier. Uh, Renegade says uh, he can't do a military buildup without following through. He needs to start a war to secure his power base at home. And Europe looks like its weakest point. Well, he seems to have figured out that um, the U.S. doesn't want to go to war to protect Ukraine. Notice Europe is being quiet because they depend on Russian gas. Well, I haven't noticed that Europe's being quiet. But maybe you're right. I think that was kind of part of the idea of getting them hooked on Russian energy was that then they would have leverage over those countries. Uh, I think a lot of Americans were pointing that out when the Germans were making deals for Russian uh, natural gas and stuff like that. Like, now you're going to be in uh, Russia's pocket. I uh, kind of admire the Russians. I read um, some Russian novels about maybe four years ago, five years ago. Um, I read uh, War and Peace and um, quite enjoyed it. It was difficult understanding the names at first or getting getting them straight, figuring out how to say them, at least in my own head, as I was just reading to myself. But um, I quite loved it. And uh, by the time I finished, I kind of felt like I had taken a trip to Russia. Uh, my brother has been to Russia and um, he's been through Siberia. This was probably 20 years ago. Uh, Russia, uh, Europe's been very quiet. All their social programs are funded because they have no air force. Um, you're saying European countries don't have a strong air force. Uh, I think they've been buying uh, F-35s, if I remember right, from the United States. Some of them. And uh, I think uh, France has designed some of its own fighter planes. When my brother was in Russia, um, or in Siberia, he said he like never saw any wild animals. He said the Russians have hunted them all basically to the edge of extinction as a food source because the people are so kind of economically desperate over there and uh, when he crossed the channel into um, into Alaska he was kind of amazed at all the wild animals everywhere and that it was like a really stark contrast to um, Russia and uh, he has a great story where he was uh, riding on the train and um, did I ever see a Spanish bullfight? Well, of course I've seen video, but no, I've never been to Spain. There's also the running of the bulls. When my brother was in Russia, him and his friend were riding on the train and they were very drunk and sort of unruly, which he said was pretty much exactly like everybody else on the train. And someone wrote a note uh, and turned it into the police. And when they were at the uh, station, the police arrested them based on the contents of this note that someone on the train had written. And they took them to the police station where they had them handcuffed in a room or something. And uh, they were confronting them with this note and saying, you should be very worried. XKGB coming here to interrogate you. And uh, my brother's friend grabbed the note from the police officer's hand, like snatched it from him, 
and swallowed it, chewed it up and swallowed it in front of all the police. <laughs> and the police were kind of a little bit afraid of him because he's very tall and it had taken like three or four of them to pin him down at the train station. So they basically just stared in shock as he chewed and swallowed this note. And uh, and then I guess the police had no no evidence anymore and they let them go like an hour later. So kind of a funny story. Time my brother got arrested in Russia. But uh, could have gone a lot worse. He also uh, was riding on a ferry in Russia up a river. And um, at some point, somebody told him like, oh yeah, all the criminals ride this ferry because they're going up the river to this town at the end of the river to go hide out. <laughs> so apparently he was on a, a ferry boat with a bunch of uh, criminals. And at one point, uh, a bunch of people tried to break into their room and rob them or something. And my brother and his friend were literally having to hold the door shut while people were trying to force it open from the other side. And I guess uh, eventually they gave up. But uh, yeah, sound pretty, uh, pretty harrowing. So Renegade says he's seen a Spanish bullfight and it was awful. Sounds pretty horrible. Like the uh, bullfighter will basically wound the, the bull over and over again until it gives up and starts to die. I know uh, a lot of people have tried to get them shut down as like animal cruelty or something. And uh, Spain didn't want to do that because it's sort of a, a traditional thing. I feel like I was probably getting off camera with my miniature painting. Sorry about that. But have you ever done the uh, running of the bulls? Oh, I cheered when the bull knocked over the bullfighter and he split his pants and his underwear was red. <laughs> oh, that is funny. That's the color that the bull is enraged by. That sounds like something out of a movie. Sounds like something out of a comedy. Yeah, I would not really enjoy watching an animal get slowly killed and uh, if the bullfighter has all the advantage of getting to practice and know what the weakness of the bull is it doesn't seem exactly very fair a uh, place I'm very interested in is Malta the island in the Mediterranean do you know much about Malta it has like a very rich and, and somewhat mysterious history in that uh, it's probably been settled since prehistoric times and it has some very ancient megalithic temples that were like buried and rediscovered at some point with like giant uh, what they call them cyclopean rocks or whatever megaliths and um, there's also very extensive catacombs beneath Malta. And there's an urban legend that back in the early 1900s, an entire class of school children got lost in the catacombs and disappeared, never to be found, which uh, uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence for that actually being a true story. But it was apparently uh, reported in National Geographic, but it could have just been a rumor or a story used to keep kids from wandering off in the catacombs on a class trip or something. But there's also like a legend that the catacombs haven't been fully explored and no one knows how deep they go and that some people believe the catacombs actually extend all the way from Malta to mainland Europe. Thought that was really interesting. Wouldn't it be cool to explore underground catacombs like that? 
Conspiracies dating back to the Crusades. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, uh, we made some good progress here. 9.30. Normally I wrap it up around this time, but I have a little cold coffee left. Uh, I'd like to power through the rest of these infantry. Let's see how many we can get done in half an hour, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, let's go to like a darker brown. Maybe I'll mix some of this uh, Gorthor brown with some black and make like a really dark skin for some of these guys. Uh, Renegade says, you know it was all land in the Mediterranean basin before the gap broke and made it sea. Uh, sounds like a theory. I don't know. Is this something that uh, that we have some kind of record of? Uh, you know, at some point, someone had a plan to drain the Mediterranean by putting a dam across Gibraltar and pumping the water out. thought that was pretty wild. Uh, maybe it was the Nazis. I can't remember whose idea it was to do that. Alright, doing some little dark skinned guardsmen now. It's true, the gap between Spain and North Africa let the sea in. It was all land before. Interesting. Well, uh, I do subscribe to the theory that the Mediterranean used to flow across the Sahara Desert and that. Uh, it uh, flowed across the real historical city of Atlantis, which was located in modern day Mauritania at the Eye of Africa, also known as the Rishot structure. If you look at the uh, satellite pictures, it looks pretty obvious that there used to be a flow of water going from the Mediterranean across the Sahara and emptying out across West Africa into the Atlantic. That's a whole continent away. The mystery of the origins of the Nile is the thing. And if the pyramids were nuclear power stations. I have, I have seen the theory that uh, the pyramids were uh, energy generating machines of some kind. I think it's a fun theory. Uh, there are old maps, uh, like dating back to Herodotus, that show the Nile flowing from the west to the east and then turning north. And I heard that they've uh, recently discovered some evidence that this is actually true. And uh, Herodotus's maps also place the Atlantes or Atlantis in Western Africa, right around Mauritania and the Eye of Africa. So that's cool. They heated hot water, the placement of the rooms and flues. Interesting. Uh, in terms of uh, ancient uh, legendary locations, uh, I did come across some very strong evidence that the Tower of Babel has been finally located in Iraq at a place called Beers Nimrud, which is, or Borsippa is the other name for it. And it's an ancient ziggurat, which is built on the, on basically on an entire hill and it had fallen into total ruins and while they were excavating it they found a cylinder uh, signed basically by Nebuchadnezzar and it said that in his day this was known as the location of uh, 
the Tower of Babel, but it had fallen into total ruin and disrepair, and he was undertaking to repair it. And so these cylinders explaining that had been sealed inside two of the uh, pillars holding up like the main gate. And they've been found and deciphered by archaeologists now. And that seems like pretty solid evidence to me. Very exciting to think that that uh, sort of legendary place was actually real and now we know where it is. As with, um, as with uh, Atlantis. And the plagues of Moses, swarms of insects and boils indicate radiation. Interesting, swarms of insects, huh? I hadn't heard that. That's very interesting. There's, uh, I, I read some descriptions of Atlantis from the writings of Plato to actually go back and sort of examine the source material. And it says that, um, I think I read that uh, Poseidon was king of Atlantis and his temple took up a large part of the center island and that Poseidon had sunk two shafts from the center island into the earth and one produced hot water and one produced cold water and it was from these that everybody on the island basically got their drinking water from. I thought that was very interesting. You can see the evidence of pools of water around in the center island where there's now like dried up salt. The 12 plagues of Egypt, the plagues of frogs, snakes, locusts, boils, and firstborn deaths. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, you know, weird, crazy theories, I came across an interesting one, which was that um, there are some people who theorize that the Lord in the Bible is actually like a dragon. Thought that was very interesting. At first, very, very out there. But I came across another um, instance of a dragon in ancient lore uh, related to Egypt, which is the account of the shipwrecked sailor. Apparently, uh, sailor traveled to visit the pharaoh and tell him what happened to him when he was shipwrecked and uh you know i guess he would have been put to death if the pharaoh thought he was lying so his life was on the line to go to the pharaoh and tell a tall tale and the Pharaoh must have believed him because he had this guy's story inscribed in stone. And the guy swore that his ship had wrecked during a big storm, crashing against an island that had cliffs on all sides. And the storm had been so violent that as the ship was destroyed, this guy was washed overboard, the sailor, and he was washed up over the cliff by the giant wave so that he ended up on the island while basically everybody else on the ship died. And the next morning when it got light, he found that he was in like a garden and there was a, a lush garden like everywhere on this island. And he wasn't alone for very long before a giant serpent appeared out of the uh, out of the trees, and he described it as being like 45 feet long with a six foot long beard, and said that it could speak and understand him, 
and it wanted to know what he was doing on the island and he explained that he was shipwrecked there and he asked it about itself and it said it lived on the island with its family like its brothers and that if he would just chill out and stay on the island for a couple weeks eventually a ship would come and it would take him back to Egypt and he says that's exactly what happened eventually a, a ship showed up he got on the ship and then as the ship was sailing away from the island he said he looked back and saw that the island was also sailing away from the ship and that's that's basically the whole story I thought that is pretty interesting uh, the ship almost or the island almost sounds like a giant ship like an aircraft carrier or something with uh, built-in food supply and this would have been a, like 2000 BC and uh, it's interesting to think that if there is such a thing as a species of intelligent giant serpent that they could be so far ahead of us in technology that they already had giant island ships in 2000 BC. It could kind of explain why we've never seen them. They could be living under the ocean or in space at this point. And so that led me to research dragons a little more briefly and found that there's some accounts or legends in China that dragons actually created humanity that the first humans were created when a dragon saw monkeys playing in its cave and it breathed something on them that turned them into humans I'm like whoa it's pretty out there but then of course I, I remembered that there's also serpents uh, are the ones who teach wisdom to humanity in the Bible and uh, I noticed something funny about that you know in like nine out of ten drawings of the Garden of Eden or paintings or, or illustrations the serpent is presented as a snake but that's not doesn't seem to be accurate to the Bible because the Bible says that when the Lord came back and found that the serpent had given wisdom to Adam and Eve it cursed it to crawl on its belly and like lose its arms and legs so that suggests that it, it wasn't a snake until after that that it actually had you know arms and legs like a lizard so I thought that's kind of interesting I'm quite fascinated by mythology and lost history and speculative theories about the ancient past and all that kind of stuff I'm not really a firm believer in much besides the uh, Atlantis and Mauritania theory but I mostly just try to be open-minded and consider all the possibilities and look for whatever evidence might be out there well we got five more guys to paint getting down to the end here let's take a sip of coffee uh, renegade says radiation explains all those plagues that's quite interesting now I'm gonna search for that tonight while I'm working overnight radiation theory pyramids plagues of Egypt That'd be a fun thing to uh, look into further. There's that uh, interesting um, account where someone enters like the throne room of the Lord and they see all these angels flying around with like six wings and covered in eyes and stuff. Animals can detect high levels and will swarm. Oh, okay. And the plague, of course, boils and death of the firstborn sons. That all fits. 
But uh, in that sort of famous account of the throne room of the Lord, the Lord is described as having a robe which is so long that it covers like the entire floor of the chamber. Like uh, as if the Lord is like, you know, maybe has a body that's like 100, 100 feet long or something like a serpent. Kind of, kind of fits. Uh, and uh, I was interested to discover that there is an actual species of dragon in the world today, like a, a flying lizard. They live in Southeast Asia and they are the genus Draco. And it's basically a lizard that has wings that fold off of its abdomen. So its wing bones are actually ribs that it can flare out to glide. And uh, it's kind of cute. It like uh, actually holds on to its wings with its little arms as it flies. And that was quite interesting. Not hard to imagine that those things could have grown much bigger in the past. Who's to say? Oh man, I just remembered I gotta come back and ink wash all these guys. <laughs> uh, probably won't be tonight. Hey! Clip Fiskin says, I have a ribs. <laughs> Do you have a dragon though? You could have one. They are real. There's accounts of uh, dragons being given to like uh, Chinese emperors and stuff as pets, which is kind of interesting. Makes me wonder if they could have been this same species or if they were something very different that is not like anything that lives today. Or is it just uh, a myth? Who's to say? Uh, I always, uh, as, in terms of myths, uh, I was always very much like uh, skeptical of the Bigfoot, uh, idea of a Bigfoot, but as I started doing some more research about it, I've basically been a little bit shaken in my certainty that they don't exist, to now I'm at the point where like, oh, I don't know, I could be, I could be open to the possibility that they may exist. The dragon myths are in a lot of cultures, probably invented from finding dinosaur bones. Could be. According to uh, the Greeks, uh, Greek mythology, there was a creature called Typhon that ruled over Greece in ancient times. And Typhon is described as having twin snake tails, uh, wings, arms, uh, human head, and a beard. And supposedly Typhon ruled Greece until the arrival of Zeus and his lightning power. And Zeus was able to defeat or destroy Typhon and uh, Typhon's wife was called Echidna, and she was a cave dweller that didn't have any wings. Thought that was, that all sounds very interesting. Interesting that Typhon would have wings and his wife would not. But uh, I kind of thought about it, and there's some kind of logic to uh, the idea that a cave dwelling species the male might have wings and the female not because maybe the male would go out and hunt the prey and bring it back or maybe the males would fly around to different caves looking for a mate and uh, wings just wouldn't be as necessary of an adaptation for the female of the species but uh, supposedly Typhon's Typhon or his race or whatever was not totally destroyed but simply banished to the underworld 
which is interesting. Like, um, oh, here we go. Uh, Renegade says, um, Hercules and the Hydra, male ants having wings to fly to other ant nests. Exactly. Like, you could see how that could be a plausible adaptation or gender dimorphism. But uh, very interesting that uh, Typhon is described as like surviving in, um, what do they call the underworld? Uh, uh, Tartarus. So they say that Typhon was banished to Tartarus after the arrival of Zeus. And it kind of reminds me of like uh, the whole myth of, um, or the, the thing in the Bible about the serpent being cursed by when God returned and uh, cursed to crawl on its belly kind of made me think like oh well all the ones that had legs were wiped out and killed and only the ones that uh, slither on their belly were left alive kind of thing but uh, of course it could just be like one of these creation myths that explains why snakes exist you know that kind of thing hard to say I always try to leave my mind open to different kinds of interpretation. Like, uh, you know, you have like the myth of the Minotaur where a beautiful bull comes out of the ocean and the queen is like enamored of it and sleeps with the bull and then gives birth to um, this bullheaded, uh, what do they call it? Um, Minotaur. And you could interpret that as like the bull is like some group of people who arrived on a ship and the bull was like their, their symbol on their flag. And the queen like slept with their leader, for instance, you know? So it's, you don't necessarily have to, I mean, most, what, anthropologists interpret these kinds of stories on sort of a metaphorical level and, and assume that they're trying to pass on some kind of history, but they're not literally meaning exactly what the text says, as it were. So I try to like see these kind of myths as you know, having multiple possible explanations. Like, for instance, dragons, you know, may not ex exist as, ever have existed as an actual literal living animal, but could have simply been uh, like, you know, the symbol of a culture, like their heraldry or whatever. Kind of impossible to say when you're talking about the distant past and myths and legends and stuff like that. All right. Well, we got through base coating all these guys with some skin tone. Uh, I wonder if some of that pink kind of shines through. I'm going to zoom in close on these guys and you can see, you know, I tried to do a thinned down coat and I feel like there is kind of a under color of pink still kind of showing through a little bit not necessarily a problem kind of gives them just like a warm skin tone and if I did give them an ink wash I think that would kind of solve it uh, we do have a little time left before 10 o'clock I could start to throw some ink wash on some of these guys let me think about that for a second maybe I'll sort them by skin tone so that I can ink wash the ones that have been drying the longest. I guess a lot of these ones in the furthest back were the first ones I painted. 
All right. Well, let's... okay. And then, what color do we want to do for the uh, ink wash? Do I have any more? What is that? Uh, Reichland Flesh Shade is what I used to use. Hey, I do. All right. There's that. It's a pretty good uh, shade paint for like white flesh. Uh, the dark gave them an ethnic flavor. Yeah. The uh, planet Icarus 2 is the closest to the planet to the uh, system star, so it kind of makes sense that they would have a lot of dark skinned people living near the equator. Uh, it also doesn't have any oceans, so it would probably have a lot of inhabited zones near the equator. Uh, what brush do I want to use for this? Um, where's my base brush? Uh, here it is. Okay, good old base brush small. That'll work. All right, let's zoom out a bit. Uh, gonna be slapping some Reichland Flesh Shade Wash on these guys with the lightest skin tones. And we're gonna try and just make this go quick. And also hopefully get them in focus on camera. All right, there we go. Might help if I actually get some paint on the brush. Uh, takes kind of a lot of Shade. There we go. I wonder if this is kind of watered down. I haven't used this paint in quite a while. Uh, yeah, I think that's already looking a bit better. Improvement. Amazing how it pops out all the details. Love it. Let's work from the front here. Uh, one sort of interesting uh, interpretation of a myth that I heard was that uh, the beheading of the hide of the uh, Medusa came from a historical or semi-historical event where there was like a, a temple where the priestesses would wear these Medusa masks and they supposedly had like magic powers and then a bunch of the men were kind of fed up with the priestesses at this temple and all their sort of power and fear that they had and they actually like a bunch of men went to the temple and sort of raided it and they pulled the masks off the women off the priestesses to prove that they were just human women wearing masks not really gorgons or whatever and that the sort of legend of the beheading of the medusa was just like a kind of a like a, a memory or, a, or like an interpretation of this historical event or something like that Oh, I, uh, Renegade says, oh, I thought it was a mirror shield turned her own power against her. I think they held up the mirror in order to approach them without fear of being turned to stone. But at least according to this story, they never had any magic power to turn people to stone anyway, except that whatever, you know, you'd have like, uh, people sort of brainwashed to believe you had the power, so maybe you would be like, hypnotized to stand still or something like that. I don't know. But I thought that was an interesting theory. I much prefer the idea that there really are some such things as sort of human snake hybrid people and they live underground and they really are immortal. I think that's a fun sort of fanciful idea, but who knows? Uh, you know, we have at least uh, had these recent reports by the Pentagon that 
UFOs are real and we don't know who's piloting them. I don't know if you believe that. Some people think, oh, well, even if they say that, it's probably just some U.S. secret weapons project that's top secret or whatever, or some new Chinese cruise missiles or something like that. But uh, I, I found the uh, footage pretty, pretty compelling, especially the one called uh, GoFast.mov that was released by the Pentagon in 2017. And uh, the sort of um, account of how that was video was gotten from a state-of-the-art F-18 camera with, uh, you know, like a visual video motion tracking system. Kind of explains why we haven't had a lot of these videos in the past is we just didn't have the technology to capture them. But of course we do have accounts of UFOs going back at least to World War II where they were common enough to be called Foo Fighters in the Pacific Theater. And uh, oh, <laughs> uh, Renegade says, um, all the monsters of Greek mythology were top half female, bottom half monster. Medusa, sirens, harpies. It was Theseus or someone. She turned herself into stone. Well, if she turned herself into stone, how did he cut her head off? Don't know if that makes sense. I did come across a very out there uh, uh, conspiracy theory that the more I heard about it, the more <laughs> believable it seemed, which is, of course, how a lot of these go. I don't want to be necessarily out there trying to spread conspiracy theories when who knows what the truth may be. But uh, I came across the uh, Nazi UFOs in Antarctica conspiracy theory, which is that the anti-gravity UFOs were a technology that Nazi Germany was developing during the war, and they had several functional prototypes, but not enough to win the war. And as the war was moving too quickly, and they were didn't have enough raw materials to mass produce these things, they eventually decided to just smuggle away their prototypes to a secret base on Antarctica so that they would um, be able to continue their research after the war while basically letting the Allies conquer Germany as that couldn't be stopped. And uh, the most interesting piece of evidence for this is that um, the United States did invade Antarctica after the war, uh, Operation High Jump, and so the sort of public reason for it was supposedly that um, the United States didn't want to lay off all these Navy, uh, sea Navy seamen right away as it would create like a economic crash, you know, or go back to the Great Depression or whatever if everybody was laid off all at once at the end of the war. So they just were trying to keep them employed and we're going to go explore Antarctica as a way to uh, keep all these people employed. But uh, the admiral in charge of it supposedly gave an interview in Chile or Argentina on his way back to the United States where he claimed that they had been attacked by uh, disc-shaped aircraft from the polar regions and the next war was going to be uh, a war uh, at the South Pole. <laughs> thought that was quite interesting. And there's also some articles from the German newspapers claiming that... Uh, the German submarine fleet has established an impenetrable base in Antarctica. So there's at least some supposed evidence for this. And uh, quite famously, the uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense 
was either jumped or thrown out of a 12th floor window shortly after this. So some people speculate he wanted to go public and they were trying to shut him up. Thought that was a very interesting theory. Can't say I'm convinced, but I, I do wonder. And I also have heard that the Russians believe that the U.S. is in contact with some kind of unknown civilization, like in, in modern day. Thought, ah, oh, that's interesting. I never took the uh, aliens in Area 51 stuff very seriously. And then um, a year or two ago, I did see an interview with Bob Lazar who's been claiming to have worked on UFOs at Area 51 for decades now. Um, and I never took him very seriously. But uh, this video was an interview with Bob Lazar being analyzed by a body language expert who was trying to determine if he was showing signs of lying or being crazy or uh, deceptive or whatever. And, and the body language expert gave him like a 100% truthful analysis. And I thought, well, that's a shock. I kind of just never wanted to think about UFOs. And it just sort of like seemed like uh, one of those subjects that if you talked about it, people would assume you're crazy. And how could you ever know the truth? So why bother thinking about it if you can never really get any confirmation one way or the other. But these days I'm more open to the possibility. It seems like you kind of have to be at this point. I, I like to think that, um, or, or I, I want to at least be prepared to the point that if I ever did see a UFO, I wouldn't be like paralyzed with fear or just like lose my mind, I would at least be mentally prepared for the possibility of encountering one. Can't hurt, right? I'm using the uh, Agrax Earthshade Wash on these guys now. What's your uh, opinion of UFOs, Renegade? Do you have one? Be curious to hear, or anyone else who wants to comment on that, feel free to leave a comment if you're uh, watching this on YouTube. Uh, I think a lot of people figure, well, they probably exist, but they're probably not aliens. I had a friend in college who's, who was quite convinced that UFOs couldn't be aliens, or at least not aliens from another planet, because he was convinced that light speed travel was absolutely impossible and required for for uh, ships to be coming here from other planets. Um, Renegade says, I think it's a question of time. I did watch a, a very interesting video on YouTube recently that was like uh, explaining the idea of a spaceship that could simply continue accelerating. And if you did have a spacecraft that could just continuously accelerate, it would never reach the speed of light, but it would start going very, very fast and, and it would actually approach the speed of light. And a spacecraft like that could actually travel to the nearest star in just like four years. That was quite surprising. So like maybe about an eight year round trip to Proxima Centauri. And I also learned that the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri, is actually invisible to the naked eye. It may be the closest to us, but it's small and faint, so you can't actually see it. That was quite surprising. I assumed that the closest star to us would be one of the brightest ones in the sky. But uh, there's actually lots of interesting things about Proxima Centauri and the Centauri system. 
Renegade says either they look like microbes to us, or we're just microbes to them, given the age of the universe. Interesting idea. Wouldn't that be interesting if there was intelligent microscopic life? Uh, did you know that they found a fish that can speak like a fish that has a language? These fish, uh, I forget exactly where they live, um, but uh, they live in an environment with like sort of cloudy water, so they can't see each other very well. So they have like a method of communicating. I forget if it's clicks or flashes of light or what. I think it's clicks. And so the fish actually find each other and communicate using clicks. And scientists have discovered that they actually have some kind of complicated language. And that really blew my mind. All right, we're making uh, Commander Brand look like a kind of a badass here with a little too much wash on his face. Maybe let's soak a little bit of that off. It was kind of cool having him have real like shadowed eye sockets. Let's maybe put a little more wash on him. Yeah, I like that. And on his hands. Good old Commander Brand, loyal again. And with these guys with the darkest skin, I think we'll do some of them with a uh, Agrax or Shade Wash here, and then we'll do some of them with a uh, Nuln Oil Wash, and they'll look a lot uh, even darker skin that way. I kind of imagine that some of these guys who are uh, penal troopers have actually been sent to the Icarus system on like some kind of transport ship to go fight to reclaim it. Probably after a certain amount of time in the penal legion, they'll get earn their earn their freedom and be allowed to settle here in this Icarus system. But uh, I do have a counter to the whole light speed is impossible theory of that. Uh, the UFOs could simply be from an intelligent species here on Earth, which uh, achieved high technology like long before human beings and has been living in some secret places like underwater or underground or something like that. And uh, I saw something quite interesting recently that uh, the largest freshwater lake in the world, Lake Baikal in Russia. Some people now think it may have some kind of underwater uh, colony of some kind because uh, when the lake was frozen over and starting to thaw out on satellite photos, two circular regions appeared where the ice was thawing out faster and these were like very clearly circular and quite large like I'm thinking you know five miles in diameter or something like that led some people to speculate that it could be some kind of circular colony at each end of the Lake Baikal underwater that were somehow producing heat that was thaw starting you know slightly thawing out the, the ice a little faster in certain areas. Uh, oh, that's quite interesting. But who knows? I try to take it all with a grain of salt. Uh, I do quite enjoy the YouTube channel of Praveen Mohan. He's a an Indian archaeologist. He totally reminds me of Indiana Jones from the movies. And uh, he basically visits Indian temples and uh, historical sites looking for evidence of aliens or m mysterious things that he can find that nobody else has ever pointed out before or weird sculptures or carvings and stuff like that. He's, he's appeared on uh, History Channel, Ancient Aliens and stuff like that, but... Uh, he has his own kind of investigation and 
Uh, he's you know, found some very interesting things, and he's quite convinced that, or at least he's he's very much open to the possibility that uh, people in ancient India could have interacted with some kind of alien life, especially the uh, the Nagas were depicted as like half human, half serpent. He likes to think that quite possibly they could be like an alien race or some species that learned to modify its own genetics to give themselves wings or snake tails and stuff like that. He's pretty out there, but uh, I enjoy his videos. Well, we did it. We uh, got all these guys uh, base coated with a new skin color and ink washed. We didn't get to the heavy weapon teams or the laser destroyer crews, but we could get them next time. This guy was a, uh, he was a um, Necromunda miniature that uh, I converted to a gene stealer called Brood Brother. So he still has the Brood Brother head, but it's not exactly specifically alien. He just has like a gas mask on. So, uh, and he has a las gun. So I've decided he's now an Imperial Guardsman. <laughs> Just about seven of these guys left. Nice to get a big head start on my Imperial Guard project. I think we've definitely got two squads of guardsmen here and a squad of conscripts ready to go. Plus I have two chimeras and at least the two Lehman Russ that have the hatch closed, although they need a little bit of paint. I'll do that probably, uh, oh, no, I'm not going to have any time tomorrow because we're playing uh, 40k. So tomorrow I'm going to be playing my Dark Angels against Necrons. And we also don't really have a narrative worked out for this game yet. Uh, going to be playing against a new player. And we'll have to spend a little time tonight thinking about the narrative. And hopefully I'll have something ready by the time we're getting the game going tomorrow. And what else am I going to be checking out tonight? I'm going to have to check out that uh, radiation theory about ancient Egypt. That sounded fun. Might be uh, doing a little bit of job hunting, trying to find something that pays really well still. It'd be nice to uh, not have to work two jobs and still be able to get all my loans paid off and stuff. All right, we're down to the last guardsman. He is pointing and running and not shooting his gun. <laughs> Let's go over there. He really should be shooting. All right, there we go all base coated and ink washed. Well, thank you everybody. I guess we'll go back to the old uh, main cam here. Thanks for joining me for another paint and chat episode of Challenger Tabletop. Tomorrow is live 40K around 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, Renegade says they found pottery jars with iron rods, copper cases, and sulfuric acid. Yeah, that's the ancient uh, electric batteries, the Baghdad battery. I've heard about that. And um, Praveen Mo Mohan talks about that also uh, in an episode where um, he says that basically they used code words to talk about the knowledge of this kind of thing. And they talk about like neck of the peacock and that actually is referring to the color of a peacock's neck, which was the same color as like the kind of acid that they used or something like that. Uh, Renegade, and how the hieroglyphs were done inside the pyramids without lamp light, no smoke particles inside. Oh, so maybe they had electric lights. You have seen uh, those uh, hieroglyphs depicting what look like elongated lamps with like a dude holding them up. Can, can, has me somewhat convinced. All right, well, uh, Renegade, thanks for joining me in this very fun discussion of uh, ancient mythology and uh, out there theories. And um, 
will be uh yeah playing 40k tomorrow and painting uh currently wednesday thursday friday 7 to 9 30 or 10 pacific time all right well see you next time have a good night